Thank you. If everyone would take their seats, please. My name is John Leone. I'll be your moderator for the night. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have his skills or his practice or his perch on the stage, but we'll try to run as uh, open and uh, democratic a meeting as possible. My name is Paul Schlichtman. I am the chair of the Arlington School Committee. My six colleagues are city, sitting to my left. Uh, we are starting a process here tonight. We are not coming to conclusions. We are not near any conclusions. We are at the beginning stages of looking at a vexing problem which derives from the utter popularity of this town. Arlington is such a wonderful place to live that people want to buy houses and rent apartments and live here and raise a family here. And that has put us in a position where we've had um, an enrollment increase from about 3,700 at the beginning of ed reform, we're now about 5,400 now, 53, 54, is about what we'll probably come in at this year with uh, the October 1 count, which is the official number. And we have been warned that we need to be able to expect another thousand children to come into this town and populate our schools in the next 10 years. So, I mean, if you're gonna have a problem this is a good problem to have, that you're well-loved and popular. But it's going to be a problem that we're all going to have to wrestle with. And it's not one board's alone. It doesn't belong to the school committee. It doesn't belong just to the selectmen or the finance committee or the capital planning committee or the permanent town building committee or the redevelopment board or town meeting. It's a problem that we all have to deal with as a community because we will all have a piece to play in finding and approving the eventual solutions to the challenges that face us which is why we're here tonight. It's not good enough for us to sit in a school committee room and discuss this among ourselves. We want this initial presentation, and that's what this is, an initial presentation to be before as wide an audience as possible so that every person in town can think about the data, think about the options, think creatively about what we can do and participate in the process going forth. I know that we have an event at, Ar at Arlington High this evening and that people who wanted to be here are also at a parents' night at the high school. Well, that's okay. I'm glad that they're up at the high school participating with their students. They can watch this tape and we commit to having as many opportunities for as many people to express their opinions on this topic as possible as we're going through. I also want to, want to note that there's one big variable that we do not have the answer for right now, and that is Arlington High School and the urgent need to renovate Arlington High. We have an application before the state in order to do that. The solutions we come with in terms of fixing Arlington High and maybe a reconfiguration there as well, when we're in that process with the state, we may come with options that are not apparent or not things that we can decide by ourselves. Lots of decisions to be made, lots of unknowns ahead of us, but there are decisions that we will need to make, the town will need to make, town meeting will need to make, and the voters will need to make. So let's start by learning tonight. The way I anticipate doing the meeting is having both presentations from Mr. McKibben and from Ms. Cowles, uh, followed by one quick round through the school committee with questions, then through the boards, to the town meeting members, to the general public. Uh, when we get through this, if somebody says something you agree with later on, feel free to say, I agree with that point and not articulate it again just because there are so many people and I want as many people to have a voice tonight. But we're not stopping here. There will be plenty more opportunities. If you're watching on cable 
If you're hearing about this later, you too will have an opportunity to learn about this, to voice your opinion as we're moving forward over the next few years when, when we will make the decisions. And with that, I would like to uh, start by introducing our superintendent, Dr. Bodie. Thank you, Mr. Slickman. Good evening, and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, just to give a little context to why we are where we are, as Mr. Schlickman mentioned, we have seen enrollment growth over the last um, decade. And in fact, in the last five years, we've had enrollment growth of over 450 students. If we were to add what we are seeing right now before our October 1 numbers are finalized, we probably are in the high 500s. Now, that is larger than any of our elementary schools right now. So it's a lot of students. And as a result, um, all of our schools right now are at or near capacity. Probably a little bit more space at, at the Stratton School, but um, nonetheless still getting close to near capacity. So last uh, winter, we, we sought biz to do a space um, and enrollment study. And uh, we were able to contract with HMFH architects and have the services of one of their principal architects, Lori Coles, who many of you in Arlington probably know as the architect for our beautiful Thompson School. So we're very um, pleased to be working with Lori again. And, and also, um, um, Ms. Coles was worked with us in, in doing an analysis of the high school space as well. So this evening, we will be hearing um, both from Ms. Coles and from uh, Dr. McKibben, who is a demographer that works with HMFH. Our intent was to have an, another enrollment um, study done just to corroborate what we were seeing in our own projections. Um, uh, he will explain his methodology, which was different than the methodology the school department uses, which is a pretty traditional way that you do projections in school systems. Um, but as, as Mr. Schlickman said, one of the, the findings of this forecasting is that we are going to see a significant enrollment in the next 10 years. What we've been seeing in the last few years is sort of a uh, two percent, sometimes one year might be three, another year but one, but if you were taking an average over the last few years, we're looking at slightly over a two percent increase. So um, with one, only one other comment, then I'll ask, uh, we'll, we'll begin the presentation. We decided somewhat at the last minute to um, uh, produce the report. I will say there's one part that's missing from it. It's the, the appendix with the um, the, the floor plans of the schools, which we didn't feel it was necessary to have for this evening. The reason that we wanted to have a hard copy is we were concerned that perhaps uh, some people would have difficulty seeing the numbers on the screen and thought it would be better to have something in your hand to look at. But if you'd like to see the, um, all the floor plans, we have this report on our website. And uh, it's under the section called announcements, as is the actual Dr. McKibben's report is embedded in the report um, that will be presented tonight, but we also have that separately identified as well on the website. So I would like to introduce um, Ms. Lori Coles. We began working with the school um, department earlier this year. Um, identifying um, where we could possibly handle all of these students is the main charge. So um, also, as Kathy has mentioned, I've brought with me Dr. McKibben, and he will speak directly to the demography work that he has done for you and how that informed the work that I proceeded to do. Um, I just want to give a brief outline. Uh, we intend to start with the enrollment projections. I will discuss sort of an overview of what we did in this planning process and sort of the background work that we did to um, understand the conditions at the, all the school buildings, the sites, and so on, and then lead into um, the schemes that we've developed 
so far, and I say so far because there's always another tweak or a different way of doing something, but the way to start looking at this is to start and to um, begin to um, take each um, situation as it comes along and think about how it affects the next situation, meaning over the years. So that's our, our plan, and I am going to turn this over to um, Dr. McKibben, and I'm going to flip the screen in one second. Thank you, Lori, Dr. Bodie, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, I want to go over the uh, enrollment, population enrollment forecast for the district and I do this in a stepwise progression. Uh, one, first I have to explain, these are forecasts, not projections. Uh, projections where you take past trends or variables, enrollment change from year to year, grade to grade, basically hold it constant, maybe add one or two variables into it and drive it out in the future. Um, the only way a projection can be correct is if the socio-demographic economic factors of the previous five years stay constant for the next five or ten years, which is why they're so rarely right. A forecast is where you develop parameters and you set socio-economic demographic parameters and if these hold and are not violated, you should have forecasts at the district level that stay within a 2% band over the ten years. Okay? So, and the other thing is, this is a two-step procedure. We first do a full population forecast for each of the attendance areas, which sum to the district, and the results of that population forecast then drive the enrollment forecast. It's based on your demographic dynamics, not your past history. So, step one is to understand what the assumptions are. And I want to go through them all, but I'll, I'll dwell on the key ones. Uh, first is we don't go into a recession. Um, second one is, and this is a very key one, particularly for Arlington, the 30-year fixed home mortgage rate stays below 5.5% over the next 10 years. Now, why is this such an important variable? It's because um, in migration into the district. If you're going to buy a home, there's a lot of people who want to move into Arlington, but it also becomes the question, can they get a mortgage? Can they be able to pay it off? Um, you know, what's the mortgage approval rate? Now, 5% is what we call a tipping point. The same thing will work with unemployment rate also. If you go above 5%, that's when you start seeing a drag on home lending and um, uh, young home buyers are going to have trouble making the payment or getting mortgages. There's a bit of a generational gap in this too. Those of us who lived through the 70s, 80s, and 90s who remember 30-year fixed being at 8, 9, 10, 11%, 5% sounds pretty good, okay? To this generation of the last 10 years, it's seen nothing but 3.5, 3.0, 4.0. Five sounds like highway robbery. So also, you remember, this generation's loaded up with a lot of college debt, too. So their debt structure is a lot different than those when we were, when we were younger. But we've calculated that at 5%, that's when you start seeing a drag on the housing market. Now, if it goes to 5.1, 5.2, stays there for a couple of months, drops back down, it's a slight drag. If it goes to 8%, your housing market will probably come to a screeching halt. So. We assume that during these forecasts, it stays below 5%. And if Janet Yellen keeps at the current rate, that's a pretty safe, uh, pretty safe assumption right now. Um, mortgage, rate of mortgage approval stays at uh, 99 to 02 levels, and we don't return to subprime mortgage practices. Why 99 to 2002? That was before the lending boom of the last decade. Um, uh, we've lost collectively, I think it was $16 trillion in the subprime bubble busting, so we're pretty safe on this one. 
no additional restrictions on home mortgage lenders or additional bankruptcies of major credit providers. The main focus here is Freddie and Fannie. Uh, they now back 85% of the new home mortgages, particularly for starter homes in the U.S. So as long as Freddie and Fannie stay solvent and they don't have trouble, we're, we'll still have a lending market out there. Uh, the rate of foreclosures does not exceed 125% of the 0507 average, again, pre-lending pre, uh, bubble uh, for Middlesex County for the year of the forecast. Full disclosure, for our housing data, we use Zillow and Realty Track. You can get both of them down to the parcel level. Uh, most people don't realize that everything about your house is public domain data. Uh, we like to use, always like to use two data sets. Uh, Zillow does a better job on existing home sales and new home sales. Realty Track does a better job on foreclosures, and we're tracking that. Right now, you're running at about 109 percent of that average, so you're, you're in pretty good shape on that one. All currently planned, planned and approved housing developments are built out and occupied, uh, or completed by 2023 and occupied by 2025. Uh, if there's any additional housing units that are platted in 2017, 18, 19, that are going to come online in two or three years, that would need to be added to the forecast. Or conversely, if any of the ones that are approved now decide not to build, that needs to be subtracted from the forecast. And as we saw in the last building bubble and collapse, they go, it can go both ways. Uh, the unemployment rate for metropolitan Boston stays below 6%. Again, that's a tipping point number. If it goes to 6.4, 6.5, for a couple months, drops back down. It's a slight drag. If it goes to 9, 10, 11%, it's a big problem. You've got to have a job to get a mortgage to buy a house. And that's one of the fundamental assumptions there. The rate of students transferring in and out of the Arlington Public Schools remains the same. We hold all your administrative policies constant, and there's a reason why we do that. That way, when you see the changes in the enrollment in the population, it's due to demographic factors, not administrative changes. If the district decides to change attendance area boundaries, or move programs from one school to another, or have more kids come from out of district, we have no idea if you can do that three or four years in the future. Again, if you make an administrative policy change, you would need to add or subtract those from the forecast results. Um, the buffer zone uh, assignments stay the same. Uh, inflation rate for gasoline stays below 5%. No building moratorium. Businesses stay vi uh, viable. Uh, another key one here, the, the number of existing home sales in the district that are a result of distressed sales, underwater mortgages, will not exceed 20% of total home sales. You're running about, again, 9% here, according to the Realty Track, so it's not that bad. Housing turnover rate, and this is probably your most important variable right here. Sale of existing homes in the district remain at current levels. The majority of existing homes made by homeowners over the age of 55. 90% of your housing market is existing home sales, just like every place else in the country. If you saw the numbers that came out this week on new and existing home sales, Existing home sales were down, new home sales were up. Existing home sales were 5.5 million, new home sales were 550,000. It's a, it's a 9, 10 to 1 margin, and probably going to be an even bigger ratio as more boomers start uh, downsizing. Existing home sales is your number one driver of population change, not new home construction. Okay? Now, most uh, turnover, and this is a very key aspect for your housing market and you're in, your in migration, you'll see a slight uptick at 62, you see a slight uptick at 65. Most people don't downsize their houses till they're in their 70s. It's not retirement that's the main driver, it's the death of one of the spouses. That's why we look at mortality rates when we do the population forecast. It gives us a proxy idea of how many houses will come on the market. And then, you know, the, the children will say, you know, the house is too big, it's, you know, come move close to us, put it on the market. And the number of houses going on the market will dictate both the magnitude and the type of your in-migration. Private homeschool attendance rates remain constant. Both have slid a little bit in the last four or five years. Recent decline in home construction has ended and rates have stabilized and there's no foreclosure of commercial property over the next uh, uh, 10 years, basically remain at 0407 averages. Now, 
these are the broad assumptions. We'll have other assumptions as we go in and we get to look like individual areas. But the first step here is to calculate the population forecast. And how we do that is our first step is we take your current elementary attendance area boundaries, superimpose that on 2010 census geography, figure out what tracks and blocks and block groups make up each attendance area, and pull the entire census and develop a demographic profile for each individual attendance area. All of our models are built by your attendance areas. We don't use national models, regional models, state models, weird generalizations. All the data is on this area. Now, I know immediately someone's going to say, 2010 data, that's five years old. What good is that? Well, I'm going to get to that in a second. It's actually very powerful data and very useful. But what we do is develop a demographic profile for each area. And the most important variable, in fact, it probably has about 40% of the explanatory value in the forecast, is the age distribution of the population. And this I want to introduce you with the population pyramid. This is the 2010 census. Okay, this is the district. We, look, we call this your demographic fingerprint. No two geographic areas have the same size and shape of population pyramid. It shows the unique age distribution. And they're real easy to read. That zero to four bar, that's your preschool. That's your elementary, middle, high school. 20 through 34, family formation ages. 70 to 80 percent of all births occurred in women between the ages of 20 and 34. Birth rates in this country haven't changed that much in the last 40 years, staying in a real tight 10 percent band. Most of the change in birth, uh, number of births in the area is not due to change in birth rate, but number of women in prime childbearing age. Ages 35 through 55, these are the ages where most households have kids in school. Could be elementary, could be middle, could be high school. 55 through 69 are your empty nest households. And over 70 are your potential turnover households, okay? Now, the first thing we do when we do a forecast, we look at what we call a dummy uh, forecast. If nothing happens, nobody moves, um, no in-migration, no out-migration, what would happen? And you'll note here, your zero to four bar is bigger than your five to nine. We're now five years later, these zero to four are now five to nine. That's your elementary age population. So your elementary enrollment has grown? Of course it has. It better have because you had bigger cohorts going in. Just like you had more middle school, more high school, you have larger cohorts aging into it. And again, we'll revisit this, re revisit this point again later as well. Um, so this is expected growth it will compare that to what you actually had, and the residual will be your either in or out migration. Okay, same thing for middle, same thing for high. Now, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure out where your out migration is. Your biggest out migration flow is 18 to 22 year olds. Uh, better than 80% of your high school graduates go on to post-secondary education. And they graduate, they go away, and they don't come back. So, they're not here to produce the next generation of school-age kids. So these are in-migrants, and most of the in-migrants who are coming in over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years did not grow up in Arlington. They're from someplace else. And you also have to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure out that over the next 10 years, the fastest growing household type in the district is going to be empty nest households. At the same time, you're going to see a growing number of households move into turnover ages. But the peak of that won't hit till after 2025, which is beyond the scope of this forecast. So we'll get there. You're seeing the very beginnings of that, that major turnover phase starting at the end of the forecast series. Um, and then you, you'll see uh, an increase there. So the key point is, is having enough people moving in bringing kids with them, and maybe having a few after they, they, they come here, to replace those who are aging out. The in-migration is the key factor. Your population alone, as it's structured right now, does not have enough women in prime childbearing age to produce grade cohorts this size. You need in-migration. In fact, if you have zero migration, your enrollment will start dropping the next day. It's, you're, it's that critical for it. 
Now quickly, I want to go through each one of the attendance areas. And this is, again, the district average. And this is one reason why we don't use district averages either, because you'll notice that all of them are different, okay? This is Bishop and then its associated buffer zone. An older population, they, their peak is 45, now in the early 50s, really empty nesting. And you'll notice the zero to four bar is about the same size as five to nine, okay? So if you've seen enrollment growth in Bishop over the last five years, it had to be due to in-migration. There was not a natural bubble coming in or wave coming in from the zero to four population. Um, same situation with Bracken, smaller population. You're, the population of your tenants there is, are, are very varied. They're, they're not equal at all. Uh, but again, uh, bigger dearth here in the 20s and 25s, again, makes it much more dependent upon in-migration because the fertility wouldn't be high enough to produce those same size cohorts. Um, Dial in the buffer zone, a similar situation. A little bit younger, uh, peak is now in their late 40s. Uh, the problem is, and this is we start looking at households in the district and people will always fall back on anecdotal information. You see a house down there, the, the Smiths or the Jones may live there, you know, but they're, they're they're not uh, empty nests, but they may be empty nests of elementary kids because they're all in middle school or high school. They may be empty nests of elementary and middle school. So you have to expand your definition of empty nesting to as it goes through the life course. Okay? So a lot of the households here will still have kids in school. They just may not be elementary. Um, Hardy in the buffer zone. This is also the area that has the highest number of rental properties in it. This is why we, it's a very, very key variable. There's single family detached homes, there's rental property. Renters move an average every uh, 18 months. Homeowners move an average every nine and a half years. They have two completely different dynamics. Homeowners are older, tend to have established families. Renters tend to be younger, still having children, um, and probably will move sometime in the future. And note this area with a high, relative high number of people in prime childbearing age has the biggest zero to four wave. Now, the thing with apartments, they may be born there, but once that first child or particularly the second one gets to age four or five, then they start looking for a house to live in. Uh, most people, if they have the economic resources, don't want to raise their kid in an apartment, want to have a house. So, you wouldn't see this much enrollment rise over five years because many of these will have moved out of the apartments and gone to houses, either other places within the district, might be first choice, or someplace from the surrounding towns. But this is where a lot of your, um, your preschool waves coming in from. Uh, Pierce, again, you see a bit of the zero to four wave here. Uh, probably the most uh, equal distribution, you still see a, a peak here in the 40s. Uh, but a little higher percentage in the 20s and early 30s, so uh, more women in prime childbearing age. And then, of course, Stratton, uh, not much of a preschool wave coming in. And again, the, uh, the peak of the population is now in their, in their 50s. Your fastest growing household type over the next 10 years will be empty nest householders over the age of 50. Okay. Um, some may move out, but not enough. You may see people move away. The question is, is not so much, are they moving away, but how soon after their last kid graduates high school, and how fast and how many of them? The magnitude is the key point here. And then finally, Thompson, again, another area that has um, a rental property in it, and you see the large zero to four way of coming in. So when you, you look back, you say, we've grown in the last five years in enrollment. The first thing I look at is, should you have grown? And how much should you have grown without in-migration? And we can establish that number from the 2010 census. We just bring everything forward five years, because we're exactly five years from the census now. So again, it, it's, it's like balancing your checkbook. You have to have an opening balance to start with. And that's what we use the census for. And that's where we uh, work all of our calculations off of. We also look at, this is a forecasted population change um, for the district, 2.3% pop growth uh, to this year, and then 2.2 towards the end of the decade. Um, and this spread quite a bit over the, the different ones. Hardy growing the fastest over this period. 
uh, Bishop growing the slowest. And you'll see a, a very, very, well, I guess Thompson's in there too. There's a very strong correlation between the median age of an area and how fast the population's growing. If you have an area where the median age is in their 40s and they have a lot of kids in middle school and elementary, slower population. Why? Because they're empty nesting. The Smith House, which has four people in it now, is only going to have two people in it five years from now. That's why we don't use the housing unit method. It doesn't have an out-migration component in it. It assumes that household size stays the same. It doesn't. Okay. Uh, in fact, household size, as a rule, tends to drop the longer the uh, the occupants have been in there. Um, also look at household characteristics, and you'll see there's a variation throughout throughout the district. And people find this most surprising. Uh, only about 28% of the households in Arlington have under 18 population. That's under 18 population. That's not school age. That's just under 18. And school age is probably closer to like 23%. Um, average household size, 2.2, but it runs the gamut from um, 2.07 in peers to as high as 256 in Dallin. Again, you'll find this real strong correlation between age structure of the population, their household size. Um, household population, we take out group quarters. Uh, so we're just looking at people in the households. That's probably pretty close to, probably getting up close to 20,000 households now at this point with your building. Um, percent of householders, 35 to 54. Again, this is the, these are the ages where most people have kids in school. 41.7% at the census has been dropping slightly since then. Percent of homeowners 65 and older, 24%, again, quite a range here within, within the district. Uh, and then homeowners, and this gives us a proxy of how many of these over 65 are homeowners. If they're in elder housing or rental property, it tends to be, um, if they move out, other elderly will move in. We're looking for homeowners that have been there for a long time, and when they move out, a new young family will move in. Okay. Single person households, 34% are single person households of the district, but 12% are single and over 65. Again, a proxy number of, this is um, usually households, if, if they're a single person detached homes, uh, where the spouse has probably already died, and this gives us an idea of what percentage of households are probably going to come on the market. Again, Bishop has the greatest percentage. Um, as they get farther into the 70s, if they're just going into the 70s now, it's going to take a while. Um, we're all living a little longer, so it might be more late 70s before they start turning over. Yeah. And then this is my favorite one. This is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the population count by individual age for each of the attendance area. And this shows you the relative cohort size. And you can see, and basically in 2010, this is kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. And you do it for each one of the attendance area districts as a whole. But as you can see uh, from 2010, if these size cohorts are going on to middle school and these size cohorts are gonna come in, your enrollment's gonna grow because they're already here. You have large cohorts replacing small cohorts. But it's gonna vary from attendance area to attendance area. Uh, again, look, Thompson's a great example. You have cohorts in the 60s, 70s, 50s, had one big one here in the 90s, and 100, 140 coming in if they all stay put. Conversely, you have a place like Pierce where it's relatively flat. But it also gives us something else we can look at too. Notice here in Pierce, 50s, 74, 62. Sometimes you'll have a one-year large cohort. When you use the old cohort survival method, you'll see this big cohort come in, it's growth. Well, is it or isn't it? It may just be a one-year big cohort and tracks that. That's exactly what it was in that aspect. You know, it could be more, more even. So what we do is we do, uh, a, we'll call a market share. And I'll give you an example at the district level next. Okay, this is taking, we do these for each one of the attendance areas, this is the easiest one to show. This is your 2010 enrollment. That's what they count in the 2010 census. And we can calculate then a market share, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. 
okay? And we can track that cohort through time. There are now first graders in 11, second graders in 12, third graders in 13, fourth grade last year. And we can see how the percentage changes. And if the percentage goes up, you've had in-migration. If the percentage goes down, you've had out-migration. And with this information, you can then do an imputation on an age-specific uh, migration model. How? Well, it's been my experience that when a third grader moves, they tend to take the whole family with them. So <laughs> pretty, pretty safe bet. Well, sometimes they don't, but that's another story. But, uh, but you can also look at, okay, here's what you've got for kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, in 2010, and this would be kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth in 2015, or whichever corresponding year you want to do, and see what the cohort should have been. And if you take this number, K through five, and compare it to this number, K through five, and look at the difference, it's almost exactly what your elementary enrollment growth was over the last four years, which tells me that about 85% of your enrollment growth in the last five years are kids that already lived here. And the other 15% is net in-migration. Most demographic correlations associations are not real time. Not households moving in, not households being built. There tend to be a delayed reaction. For example, if a family moves into the district and they have uh, household formations complete, their kids are age five and older, you see the immediate impact total of that household on your enrollment right then, okay? You got three kids, boom, they're in your school the next year. If they're a young couple moving in and have, has, have, haven't had their kids yet, or they have one that's a preschooler, and maybe have another one there later, you may not see the full impact of that household moving into your district for three, five, seven years, okay? So the problem is, is people will see things anecdotally, and what they see is correct. I mean, I've never heard anybody at a school board meeting, you know, tell me something that's not right about their district. The problem is they think that the impact is immediate in real time, and um, they want to generalize it to the entire population, and they only look at one or two variables, and there's actually about 25 out there you need to be looking at, okay? But this will tell us empirically how your population's doing, okay? And, and actually measure what is the net impact of the new housing construction and more importantly, the existing home sales, okay? So, and you'll notice that um, you're, you're averaging probably in the high 80s, which is pretty normal for a, uh, an inner ring suburban school district. Uh, I think the highest I've ever seen is like 96%. Uh, there's some other ones I've seen as low in the, in the low 70s, but no one has 100%. You got private school, you got uh, home school, you know, out of district transfers, whatever the case may be. So high 80s is probably pretty normal. So now, this is probably what's thrown a lot of people off. Notice the, your new home construction. This going from 40 up to 120, you probably do 120 this year too. You see this increase in home construction over the last five years and you want to assume, okay, that's what's, that's what's causing our enrollment growth. It's not, okay? It may later, but not right now, you know? Of course, a lot of them has apartments too. So again, there's gonna be a two, three, sometimes five year lag on that. Um, each, this is for the district as a total, each of the attendance areas also in your report has a, uh, the full population uh, forecast. This is total, there's male and female above it. Uh, but a couple of key things here, one is median age, 41.8 for the district, heading for 43, okay? When your median age gets above 40, it's real tough to grow. You're gonna to have to have a lot of migration to compensate for that because most people are, are done having kids at that time. So and we also look at the number of births and deaths. This is for the period 2010, 2015, 2,400 births, 1,900 deaths, natural increase, 500, net migration, 610, 
and you'll notice that the births go down and the deaths go up slightly. Well, the deaths go up because you're getting older, and the births go down because there's fewer people in private childbearing age. Now, someone's going to notice 610 people migration over five years. That's way too low. Net migration, okay? Net is here's the number of people moving in minus the number of people moving out. Your total migrants is uh, for the five-year period, you're probably looking at about, I'd say about 5,000 moving in and about 4,400 moving out, okay? Again, most of your out migration, 18 to 22 year olds and the over 70s, most of your in migration, 25 to 40 year olds and zero to fours, okay? But the net impact, that's what you gotta remember, because everybody can tell me where the growth is, to where people are moving in, they won't tell me where the decline is. And you have to look at both sides of the equation if you're going to get it right. Okay. So the results of these population forecasts then drive the enrollment forecast. Okay. Now, there's another aspect here I have to introduce you to, and, and the analogy I use is a bucket of water. Okay. If I have a bucket of water and I'm pouring water in the top, and there's a hole in the bottom of the bucket. Think in migration, out migration. If I'm pouring water in the top faster than it's going out that hole in the bottom, the level's going to rise. But if for some reason that hole in the bottom gets bigger and the water's now going out faster than I'm pouring it in, even if I'm pouring in at the same rate, the level's going to drop. Enrollment works the same way. You're looking at year to year changes. Um, what's the number of students graduating out versus the number of students coming in? Why is your overall growth slowing down after the end of the decade? Very, very simple. You're going from high school senior classes of around 300 to heading to almost 400. The hole in the bottom of the bucket's getting bigger. So even if people move in at the same rate, same number of kids, it's going to... I have that effect on people. Um, uh, you know, I, look at the kindergarten, the first grade doesn't really change that much, you know, but most of this slowdown is due to larger cohorts graduating out. So that's why you see this, this bending trend. And you see it more in the, in the elementary grades because, again, you're going from basically close to 400 fifth grade cohorts to 500, okay? People keep moving in, having kids. That's why you can't keep growing forever, okay? And you, you top off about 2019, 2020 and slowly decline. Having said that, I want you to note that you go from 2884 last year to forecasted 3033 in 2024. So yes, you have that arc pattern, but if you have space and facility issues now, you're going to have space and facility issues 10 years from now too. You're not going to be saved by a demographic downturn. Indeed, in fact, you see the wave continue to go into your middle school, 1,100, peaking almost 1,500, not quite getting there before it starts turning. And at the high school, 1,200 to about 1,600. And of all the numbers I have up there, the 12th grade or the high school forecast, I have the most confidence in. Why is that? Because almost 90% of that growth are kids that already live in the district. They don't have to move anywhere. They're already here. It's just bigger cohorts going through. So you're pretty much going to go to about 1,600 high school in the next 10 years as these larger cohorts start aging into your, your school. Now, one of the procedures we do with all of our forecasts, and we've done over 1,000 school districts in 23 states over the country over the last 25 years, for the first three years after we do the forecast, we contact the district the next fall, have them send us their official fall numbers, and we do performance evaluations. We've been doing this for years. Um, we want to see how we're doing. Um, have the assumptions been violated? Is it an administrative change? Is it a demographic change? And kind of help the school district and the administration, the board, and the community understand what's going on. Now we have preliminary numbers for this year. This will change a little bit. Um, but this is the evaluation for, against this year's ADM numbers. And our forecast for 86 students too high, about 1.6%. We're hoping that works out a little bit better when um, um, 
the final enrollment numbers come in. Um, still within our 2% band. But the thing that really concerns me the most is the kindergarten. Kindergarten came in 69 students below what we forecasted, 14%. That's way beyond the bounds. Now, we don't use kindergarten to fire our forecast. We use first grade because kindergarten has way too much variability in it. And also, you're, you're taking a birth year and you're turning it into a, a school cohort. Um, when you look at births, you look at any kind of census data, it's January 1 to January 1. Whereas the school year, it's whatever your cutoff day is, some states it's June, July, August, whatever it might be. And if you have a year where a, a high proportion of your births are in the fall, we call it the cold winter effect, you'll see a disproportionately small, like a small cohort and then a large one the next year. We're tracking it for this year's too after the last winter. So uh, next year when we um, do the uh, forecast, this number may stay in the, in the low 500 range, but if that is what happened, we'll, we'll, we'll see a kindergarten number that's back up above 550. Um, so again, that's the big thing here. The, the first grade was only off by 20, so that's, you know, that's kind of within the bound. It's, it's pretty close at that point. But, uh, but for all in all, it's, 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 uh, it's not too bad for, the, for the, uh, the run through. So again, we'll go back and look at an evaluation in, in uh, uh, fall of 2016 and tracking. So you are tracking growth. You're still growing. You will continue to grow. Um, we just have to uh, keep a close eye on your, um, on your cohort sizes. And when the official uh, October numbers do come in, We'll put together uh, a final and revise. We do this by school too, by the way. We'll send the district a final and revise evaluation for the first year of the forecast. So. Thank you very much, Jerry. So that was a lot of information. I've heard it a lot, and I still, it's a lot to process. So um, speaking of process, that's what I want to go over with you all, is what, what did we do in this space planning effort? Um, uh, concurrent, I was doing some work concurrently while um, the forecasts were being developed. And surely the for forecasts are one of the first things that are the most important thing. Everything I'm going to show you, you have in your packet. There's a lot of numbers, and I don't expect you to be able to read them as much as we tried to blow them up as much as possible. But the colors are helpful. So what I did was I took um, Jerry's lots of information and numbers and called it down to some peak numbers and where you know stress points are going to happen and at what schools and when. So what you're seeing here is the first five-year uh, numbers and where the growth is happening, Brackett, Hardy, and Thompson. Also at Audison and Arlington High School. This is a five-year change. Um, you're looking at, you know, 87 more children at Brackett, 113 more at Hardy, 110 more at Thompson in five years. And then looking down to Audison, you're getting an another additional 200 plus and at the high school over 150. The yellow highlighted numbers are the change that happen in the next five years. So that's showing that um, what, what again was a, an outcome of the forecast is we have a wave. We have a wave going through the system and what's happening is uh, your elementaries are growing first and the, that cohort of children are going to move into your middle school and then move into your high school. And so the yellow that you're seeing here is showing that continued growth. So on top of the 200 or so children at, at the middle school, another 150 plus would be coming in. Similarly, um, on top of the 154 at the high school in the first five years, it's projected to be another 226 students. 
So I just want to click to everyone's favorite image, which unfortunately I forgot to put in the report. It will be on the website and on the report next time. But Kathy likes this one a lot. This one is a graphic showing what that chart just said. The first image, they're both a map of the town. The first image is the five-year change, and you're seeing schools like Thompson and Hardy. The differential is the blue. And then when you come another five years on top of that, so 10 years out from now, you're seeing that bubble hit your high school, hit your middle school. And there's still, there's still growth. There's still more students at the elementary schools than you have now, but it's not continuing to grow. I'm not going to probably describe this very well. I'll make Jerry chime in if he needs to. But the interesting thing is we can't all say, oh, good, oh, good, it's going down. It's going to just bubble, bubble right through here and we'll be all set. Um, if you think about those pyramids that Jerry was showing you, every neighborhood is growing at its different rate. So now we're talking about, again, these particular elementary neighborhoods. But in time, it will be a different neighborhood that's selling their homes with new families coming in with children. So it's something to be aware of. It is a wave. Um, again, all things being equal, that the Boston area and Arlington with it will be economically sound and a place that people want to live. Let's all hope for that. Um, the wave will continue. Home sales will continue to happen. New people will come in. And so, so it's just that to keep that in mind, because I know a lot, a lot of folks would look back to this and say, oh, well, you know, it all, it all levels off there at the elementary schools. We're, we're going to be in good shape. In truth, 10 years from now, the elementary schools will be higher than they are today, even without this growth pushing through still at, those, uh, at, the, at that age level. Again, that we can forecast. Um, so another step, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm happy to answer questions. Another step that we did in the space planning process was to go to all of the schools, to look at their sites, the property around the schools, to assess what's happening inside and outside the building. Why did we do this? We wanted to understand two things. One, the capacity of the buildings, and two, their ability to be expanded. Can they take an addition? Can they have modulars? Is there a way to grow at this, at this site, at this school? And so, uh, in effect, Kathy already highlighted, generally, most of your elementaries, with the exception of Stratton, are reaching their capacity. Uh, the Odyssey is also more than reaching its capacity. And, um, but only some of them have a good uh, outlook for being able to put an addition on. And that has to do with things like um, uh, the size of the site, the property, um, the topography around the school, if it's very, you know, rolly hilly and it's hard to actually put an addition on. It also has to do with where you could physically attach to the building. All of these things were looked at uh, um, at the school buildings. I will preface this conversation that I'm not ignoring the high school, but I did not focus too much on the high school, mainly because we know and hope that it's going to be um, a project that will get a full feasibility study and assessment um, in the next year or so. Um, so we just wanted to preface that I'm not ignoring it. It's just um, we really wanted to focus on, first of all, the immediate need at the elementary levels and so on. So back to that. So the use and capacity, again, I don't need you to be able to read this. They are all in your um, handout and on the web. Um, what we did was, uh, in walking through the school buildings, identified classrooms, how many there are, how they're being used, if there's any additional space in those, room, in the, in those school buildings. Um, so we hit sort of the key you know, number of kindergartens, classrooms, art, music. Is there a computer space? Is there an after-school space? And quantified the number of specialist spaces. And I need to have a big asterisk. Again, you'll see in the, in the report to explain this. Um, the identifier for my, my thinking about this, about a specialist space, is is it a room that's the size of a classroom? 
So could it be a general classroom? So it's not to say that there's only one specialist space at Bishop. There may be other smaller size rooms that are used by specialists, but that's not what I was looking at. I was purely looking at are there rooms here that could be a general classroom? But the point being, these are all programs that you have, and so they can't become general classrooms all that easily without eliminating a program, moving a program to a different school, things like that. So, so again, this was just more of a fact-finding, gathering mission. Uh, school acreage, this data, like, collected a lot of data from the town's website. Um, and then uh, just looking at, there is a difference with how many students are in the classroom. Um, how meant and therefore how many students you can accommodate in that school building. So again, just as a diagram, um, I said, you know, what if there's 25 students per classroom? What if there's 22 students per classroom? So again, all of this is part of um, a fact-finding mission, gathering the information to understand what we have. Um, so we then launched into looking at scenarios schemes, ideas of how we might accommodate the different um, enrollment growth needs at different schools. So I'm going to preface this conversation by initially when we were looking at um, this, this puzzle, um, the Stratton renovation was in the mix, meaning we were thinking, oh, well, we need to accommodate those students for the one year that the building's being renovated somewhere. Why don't we do that? And it will also solve other problems. The struggle we were coming across at that point was we were making a rushed decision about what would affect all of the rest of the decisions you were going to make. So it was decided at the last school committee meeting to, in fact, house the Stratton population on the Stratton school site in one year temporary modular classrooms. So it sort of solved that need um, within its project budget. So it became separate from this discussion so that we could then you know, focus on going forward as opposed to feeling uh, tied to making a decision, an immediate decision for Stratton that would affect other decisions. I hope that's clear. Um, so one of our schemes is to uh, put modular additions on Hardy and Thompson. The bracket, which is also uh, experiencing growth, the concept here is to relocate two program spaces to therefore get classroom spaces at bracket, which will, at least for the near term, um, solve the needs at bracket. I say that very clearly because, and again, I know it's hard to see the, everything on the screen here, but the highlighted, not in gray, but in the light orange, are peak numbers at each of these schools. And so bracket is projected to continue to go up. So we will need to, if that does, as, as expected, um, think a little more about what can happen at bracket. The more immediate elementary needs are at Hardy and Thompson. And so this scenario assumes that we put additions on those two schools, additions of six classrooms each. And in one, scheme 1A, one those additions are made out of modular construction. Um, doesn't necessarily cost less, but it's faster. And the difference between scheme 1 and scheme 1A, one as you're about to see, is 1A assumes we, we uh, put those same additions on in permanent uh, traditional construction additions, which would take a year longer. So um, the next piece of this puzzle, and um, we've talked a lot about this uh, amongst the group of the school department, um, is to do with the uh, Gibbs School, uh, formerly the East Middle School. And um, we have gone there, we have looked at the school, we are as, as you all are aware, it's fully used right now under leased agreements um, by very important um, programs for the community. Um, so all of that being said, this is not an easy 
you know, thought process, but um, it is a school-owned property. And if as things bear out and we have a thousand more kids in 10 years, we need to be looking at what, um, what's available, what's possible. So this scenario um, looks at uh, using the Gibbs School for the sixth grade. And what that does is allow Audison Middle School to function with a little over 1,000 students instead of over 1,500 students, which um, for any of you that have been to the Audison Middle School would know that 1,500 students is impossible in that building. It's pretty much reached its capacity now. Um, and there's a lot of challenges to considering expanding that building, which I'm, we're happy to talk more about. But the idea that um, in the interim to be able to do the work that's needed at Gibbs, uh, there would be some temporary modulars also needed at Audison. That's how pressing um, their enrollment growth is. And then this assumes the uh, existing sort of 9, 12, 9 through 12th grade high school would go through the process with the state funding agency. Um, and hopefully uh, in that process there will be a, an agreement on the enrollment numbers that you'll be designing for. Because um, what we're looking at here, and this is at the end of the page at 10 years, you're almost at 1,600 students at the high school with no signs of that slowing down yet. Um, Another thing to discuss just on this first slide before we go into the other ones, which is um, relevant to all of them, is the, the notes down here with the words comparative costs. These are not cost estimates. These are not numbers to go out and buy something with tomorrow. These are comparative costs between the schemes that we have. So they are relative to each other. They are my best professional guess, but I am not a cost estimator. And they're not based on developed drawings of details of anything. They're based on cost per square foot and sort of rule of thumb numbers. But, but by that point, they're all based on that same thinking. So therefore, it's a tool to use for all of us as a comparison between the schemes. Oh, OK, that one's more expensive than the other one. Oh, that'll be less expensive than the other one. That is all it's for. Um, so the next scenario um, is very similar as far as time frame, and the only difference is the dollars go up a little bit because this is the one that would have uh, uh, permanent traditional construction additions at your two elementary schools. And going on to the next scheme two. Um, so scheme two says, well, what if we do something a little different? What if we just temporarily solve what's needed at the elementary schools because we're going to renovate Gibbs for the fifth grade? So I call this one a little bit about kicking the, kicking it, kicking the can down the road a little bit because so now we're, we're moving those students out of the already at capacity elementary schools, moving that fifth grade into Gibbs what does that mean? Well, that means now we still need to solve Audison, because Audison cannot handle all of its population. And so this scenario says, well, to handle Audison, you now move the eighth grade to the high school. And so the eighth grade becomes part of the planning process that you would do with the state for a new high school. And so you'd have an 8-12 campus. Um, so it does, you know, it would solve Audison a little bit later because you would be waiting for that. But again, in the interim, um, I think I'm showing sort of two different banks of, you know, getting modulars temporarily at Audison until um, a high school project was put online. Um, the last little note here you're seeing here, we also looked at using Gibbs as a kindergarten school building. And physically, you could make that happen. We believe a couple things. Number one, the renovation would be more costly. 
uh, because as I think we all know, kindergarten rooms get their own bathrooms, so that's a lot of bathrooms you'd be putting in there. Busing costs would be higher, and we're talking about a three-story building, which is not ideal for your youngest population to be traveling up and down three stories. But we did look at that. It would have the same effect in terms of the rest of the scheme here. It would then alleviate the, the pressures that are happening at the elementary, move it over to the middle school, then moving the eighth grade over to the high school. So um, again, a step by step. Now the other note that's on here that's important is those comparative costs that I've developed. Um, in this scenario, um, there would be a cost to putting the eighth grade at the high school. So your high school project overall would be a more expensive project. Um, I'm again just projecting a number of what that might be. There would be state reimbursement at that point. Again, I don't know that exact number, so these are just sort of uh, rule of thumb, um, square foot, and so on numbers to give an understanding of the impact of the scenario that we're talking about. And then uh, we go to, I don't know what it was. I think I might have skipped something, 2A. I don't have a graph for it. Thanks. OK. So, so this one was a little different in that um, we, were, we were going to move the fifth to Addison, seventh to Gibbs, and eighth to the high school. So again, what you're seeing here time frame wise and the fact that um, you know, you're, that's how you're solving the first elementary crunch is still the same. It's just a matter of what grades are where in the system. You know, there's been a lot of very initial conversations about you know, sixth grade is an incredible transition grade. It would be great that they were in their own building. Oh, well, maybe seventh grade. It would be good if they were in their own building. So there's pluses and minuses to all of these scenarios. But sorry, 2A is on your sheet. It's just a little note on the bottom. Um, the, the, it's just that scenario different. Otherwise, everything else about it is very similar to this whole chart. So in scheme three, it says, can we solve everything just with modular additions? And so this is looking at, uh, again, similar to 1 and 1A in terms of the elementary schools. And they would each get six modular classrooms additions. The crux of this is what happens at Audison. And Ultimately, over a period of, uh, I think it's six, seven years, Addison would need 20 classrooms as an addition. And I'm talking about classrooms. I'm not talking about increasing the size of the cafeteria, or the gymnasium, or the nurse's office, or the administration, or any of the shared use core spaces of that building. And again, if anyone's ever been in that building, it's fully used now. This scenario is saying you're going to go from, we're just a little over 1,100 to over 1,500 kids on this site and in this building. You're hearing the way I'm saying it. It's not something that I would recommend only because I do not believe that that school building could handle that population even with, again, putting modular classrooms. So that is what this note is saying here. It does not increase the core spaces. And there is physically no way to increase the core spaces. Audison is more or less landlocked and topography locked. So there's no way to expand the building. Even what we're talking about for these 20 classroom modulars, which would be stacked modulars, you'd be taking over the parking lot. So it would be even that much more of a landlocked and um, difficult building to maneuver around. And then we have just one more, um, the fourth, fourth scheme. Um, so th this one we looked at to say, is there a way to get two grades at the Gibbs school building? 
And the only way to do that is, in fact, to not only just renovate the building, but add on to the building. And so this would, this would say that, first of all, we would just do the temporary modulars that we need to to get by at the elementary levels until Gibbs was online. So that's similar to some of the other ones. And it says that you know, if you pull the sixth grade out, then you've also solved Audison. So on the surface, this is very much like, wow, we do one thing on one site, and we solve elementary and middle school difficulties. Um, I think the difficulty that, that comes in here is that Gibbs is not a very big site. And so um, it's, uh, you, you would, by building this addition um, to accommodate uh, two full grades here, you would be m more or less taking over anything that's open there, the whole parking, the basketball courts, and so on. Um, the, the other problem here is similar to what we were just saying about Audison, is that addition would be the classrooms. It would not be solving the size of the cafeteria, the size of the gymnasium, and so on. So this would be, again, a nearly 1,000 student school and you would need more shared use core space to be able to make it function. So, um, so we're, again, we, we looked at it, we're, you know, we're, we're happy to continue looking at any of these and you know, other sort of variables because I think you know, more heads in the room, somebody's gonna come up with some other scenario that we haven't thought of and that's, that's just the way it should be. This is, this is a work in progress. This is a beginning of that process. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's a puzzle. And what we're gonna show here is just a little bit of a thought-provoking um, diagram. So what this is is the four schemes plus the 1A, what happens at the elementary, what happens at the middle, what happens at Gibbs, and what would happen at the high school. And so the one I'm missing is the one I keep missing, but it's 2A and it's very similar to 2. It's just what grades are where. So the impact is the same. So what this next diagram shows is we have to make a decision. What's the first decision you made? Let's say you've made the decision to put permanent traditional construction at Hardy and Thompson. So that's something we need to be thinking about in the near term, and that decision gets made. As you can see, oh, one. as you can see, that starts to preclude other things from happening, if that makes sense. So once you sort of made the decision that you're going to put permanent additions at these two schools, well, you're now no longer moving the fifth grade to Gibbs. And if you're not moving the fifth grade to, get to Gibbs, you're also not doing this scenario of moving fifth and sixth to Gibbs because you're still not moving the fifth grade because you just put additions on your other schools. So if you're starting to follow the thinking here, it's, you know, it's the puzzle of when you make one decision, it will impact how these other decisions are made or, or just sort of eliminate things that maybe, oh, well, that was a good idea. Oh, but now we can't do that because it no longer makes sense. And, that, and that's going to happen. So we were calling these the if-thens. Um, so similarly, now if you've also made the decision to build modular construction, but with the thought that it's a long-term modular additions to um, the schools, which happen at in scheme one and in scheme three, you again are solving it at the elementary grades. You are no longer moving fifth grade. So these scenarios do not happen. Um, and then, I think I have one more. So now let's just say we just start with some temporary modulars. We just start to next year put some temporaries on or maybe the year after and, and um, hedge our bets for a decision or something. And, that, and that's fine too. So that would be um, you know, the start of or thinking of the schemes two and, two and four here. But that starts to... Um, Take away. I'm sorry. I'm losing my train of thought on this one. It t it takes away. I know it does. Um, these two here. Oh, um, because you you're not doing permanent, so you haven't solved fifth grade anywhere. You're only temporarily solving it. So other things are still open to you in terms of moving the fifth grade. So 
you can just, this is just a small example. We could keep going with these, but I was getting a little bonkers going, if then, if then. Um, it, will, it will be like that. So I want to end here. I'm going to just end on our bubbles that you didn't get a chance to see in your handout, but you will be able to see in the, on the website soon. And I think we're going to open to questions, and they may be questions to do with the enrollments. Um, Jerry is Jerry okay. is here with me, Dr. McKibben. And so here, here's how we're going to do this. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, what we're going to do is we're going to start, we're going to focus this meeting on questions and learning uh, rather than opining on any one particular solution. Um, there'll be plenty of time for that later. Uh, once we have all the facts out and uh, the new ideas. Um, so we're going to start, uh, first of all, I do want to recognize Representative Garbley is here with us. Uh, Representative Garbley worked very hard uh, with us and with the state to get the Thompson School renovated. He's been working with us with, uh, with the high school and he's going to be a great ally for us going forward in this project. And I'm very appreciative that he's here. He's a former member of the committee. Uh, so we'll start by going down the, uh, the row. We'll start with Mr. Heiner. Uh, uh, microphone, please. There, there might be some Im immediate temporary ones, but in the final, no. Okay. Um, who's next in line? Mr. Pierce. Hasn't it been discussed? Um, I would say it has not been discussed, and maybe the reason why is no one really thought there was any land. So no, no obvious blank plots of land were anywhere. Um, and then what would it be? You know, would it be uh, another elementary school in its entirety? Would it be um, a smaller? Middle school. I mean, so you know, that certainly is possible, but we haven't talked about it at this stage yet. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Dr. Allison Ampey. A microphone. Um. Oh, sorry. Um, I have two questions. One for Mr. McKibben. My understanding is Arlington has a historically higher than average maternal age at first birth. Does that affect your your calculations at all? A higher what? higher age for um, women when they give birth to their first child? Yeah, that would uh, have the effect of lowering average household size and number of uh, children per woman. The later you start, the fewer kids you have on average. But it's not going to affect what you have here? Well, if what? your age of first birth goes up to 35, yeah, I'm going to be way too high, you know. Um, the, the key point is, again, going back to the point, it's not births, it's in migration. You don't have enough women in prime childbearing age now, even if the total fertility rate was four. It had to be up, up to that level before to have age cohorts large enough to or women cohorts producing uh, women producing cohorts this size. You, you're about half your enrollment has to come from outside of the district through in migration. So, and average age of first birth right now is 28. So, if it's more women in their 30s, but not not here. Not in this town. Not in this town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, no, uh, excuse me. No, uh, we can't okay. talk to the audience. Uh, excuse me. We can't. Excuse, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, this. Uh, everybody will have a chance to talk, but we've got to do this in order. <clears throat> if I had been allowed to finish. Nationally, the average age of first birth is 28. Any place where you have high socioeconomic and high educational attainment for the females, the age of first birth goes up. 
My wife is a PhD, had her first child at 34 years old, but we have one. Fecundity is finite. It's from, technically it's from 15 to 44 years old. However, uh, the biological ability, the fecundity of women to have kids after 35, as you all well know, drops off. If you start having kids at 34, you're most likely only going to have one, two, maybe three on the outside. If you start having kids at 22, the probability of having four or five are much greater. That's what those numbers mean. Are you having kids? Yeah. By the way, on, on this point, how many people here have kids? Okay. How many of you are going to have any more kids? <laughs> That's the problem, folks. You, you, you got your work cut out for you. Um, we know where the current kids are at. That's not the problem. But, and how many of you are going to leave the school district as soon as your last kid graduates high school? Aha. So here's the household with kids. It hasn't been there now, and there will not be another school-age kid come out of your household until you move away and new, someone else moves in. That's the dynamic you're not looking at. Okay? We know, and we already have the numbers, only a quarter of the households have kids in them. You need those nasty empty nesters to move out, let new families move in. That's, that's the secret. But you guys, you're done. You're not going to contribute anything else to the pool here in the future. So that's what you're forgetting. Mm -hmm. okay. OK, thank you. Um, and one question for Ms. Coles. Can you talk about how permanent the modular, permanent modulars are? How long do they live? I mean, how, how well do they age, and how long do they last? Yeah. So we talked a little bit about this. Um, we would recommend if you were to plan on building them out of modular construction and want them to last um, to do a lot of upgrades to what a traditional modular would be. If for those of you who are either familiar, have either been in one, I mean basically a modular classroom is a box, so just a box that's a metal box. Um, it's, they typically come, you know, when they're, they're they're typically for temporary use. I mean, they're literally, usually the job trailer for the contractor is using one of these. Um, so a typical off the, sh off the assembly line would have sort of the least efficient mechanical, the noisiest mechanical equipment, uh, minimal insulation, poor window. I mean, they don't, they don't come like you would build a building. So we would recommend with the plan to keep them long term that you would spend that additional money to do that. Um, which may be in part why my numbers are pretty close in terms of the cost for it. Um, you know, doing as much as you possibly can, they, they can, la I mean, you would be cladding them in masonry, you would be making them as solid as you possibly can. Um, you know, it's hard for me to say exactly because we haven't built one like that. I think the closest thing my firm came to is a preschool for Wellesley, and they wanted it to be a 20-year building. And if my memory's any good, which it's not, um, it's probably close to, you know, 14 or 15 years old now. Um, but they were putting the extra money in for a 20-year solution. So would you start to feel the effects after 20 years of what you're doing? Maybe. I mean, I think, you know, you know the, 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 the creaks and groans in the settlement probably will, will be different than a traditional, you know, foundation up. Um, addition which you expect to be a 50-year building. Ms. Starks. Um, my question is actually for Dr. Cody. Um, I noticed in the enrollment numbers that we had, um, the kindergarten numbers for this year were listed as 479. And I was wondering if you could give us what the current kindergarten numbers are for this year. I think as of earlier this week, 483, they, they still seem to be a little bit of flexibil um, vacillation with all of our numbers, but it's still in that neighborhood, yes. Mr. Thielman. This question is for Laurie. Um, could you just talk to you talk to you about your impressions of the Gibbs School when you walked around it, its viability as a as a operating high of a operating uh, public school, 
and the process that we would need to go through to verify its uh, capacity to house a public school? Um, so my impression was uh, it's a good sized building. Um, I sort of en envisioned something small and not very functional. It's a good sized building, um, uh, smallish but decent sized gymnasium. Um, there have been changes since it has been turned over to other uses, um, but it's still primarily being used as a school building. Um, so in those changes, you no longer have a, a, a full functioning kitchen. Um, so things like that would need to be done. Um, the exterior envelope seems very solid to me. Um, I think you'd want to do things like finishes and lighting to make it feel like a, you know, a newly thought out building. Um, I'm, I can only guess because I do not have a team of consultants with me that probably mechanical upgrades um, uh, could be technology data upgrades are needed. Um, so what's the second part of that? How, how do you determine? I mean, I think a, I think a, f a, f a fuller investigation with, with engineers involved um, to really look at the existing conditions um, and identify. And I think, you know, one of the things that we talked a lot about with the school department is, you know, you know what's the range? Because, you know, you could elect to do this amount or this amount on that building. So there will be certainly a cost differential um, based on how much scope of work you'd want to do. And I think that, you know, I mean, it's not a long and involved, but I think a little bit of a, a feasibility study that would tell you here are all the things that absolutely have to be done, should be done, would be nice to get done, you know, so you have sort of that understanding of um, what the possibilities are and then put some cost to that before you proceeded. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, here. Uh, yes, uh, so I just wanted to share a worry that I shared with Dr. McKibben earlier. Um, uh, according to the analysis, uh, the kindergarten age should peak this year. Now, of course, we've seen numbers lower than expected, so that's interesting. Um, but the assumption is that the number of um, in migration is going to decrease and the number of out migration is going to increase so that we only get a retention rate of around 78% five years from now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that may be true. I mean, I think what you said to me is you don't think there's enough places for people who want to move in to move in. But I still sort of wonder, given the kind of recent trend that we've seen in the last couple of years um, and the retention rate that we've seen in the last couple of years, I, I'm just sort of worried about it, that, that maybe the numbers are sort of underestimating the problem a little bit. Um, the second, the second thing I wanted to ask is... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, was there a question in there? No, actually, I wanted to just share a okay. worry. <laughs> no, there, and there, I know, there, I remember you gave me an answer, and it, okay. it very there, well may be true. But. There was something in there I wanted to respond to, though. Okay. Oh, well, do you think that, the, um, that there's a reason that the, either the out-migration is going to be um, bigger or the in-migration is going to be smaller in the coming years, the next few years? Well, I think your out-migration is going to be bigger for two reasons. One, you're going to have more graduating seniors, and two, you're going to have more population over the age of 70 downsizing. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I just mean uh, families with kids under the age of five. So your assumption is that it's going to sort of decrease I, to 78 That's going to be driven by whether or not they can afford to get a, uh, they can get a mortgage or not. You know, they, they may want to live here. They may love Arlington. Uh, but if they can't get a mortgage, they're not going to move here. The, the demand for moving into Arlington is far greater than, A, the number of houses available for people to move into, and B, their economic wherewithal to afford it. Okay? And that's your real, your real dictating right there. So even though you have new housing units being built, it's not enough. And if, if you doubled it, it would be a different issue. So it's, it's pretty well cast in stone now, given this age distribution. You know, and the number of houses available, you see this trend. Um, the in migration, um, you'd have to have, if you could convince an extra hundred empty nesters a year to move out, that would help it. And you could do that maybe with some uh, building of elder housing in the area. Allow people to downsize their homes and stay in their community they want to stay in. Okay? That, that might get people to decide, well, 
let's cash in, get the equity in the house. I can still live in Arlington or the area, and it puts it in the market. Right now, there's there's a there's a pretty dire shortage of uh, you know elder housing in the area, and I think that's probably the biggest shortfall right now to that. Um, the second question uh, was asked to me by several parents. I just wanted to ask you about it. Um, why have we not considered um, turning Gibbs into another middle school or re, you know? Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, and I raise it again because it stores prima facie seems like, you know, one obvious sort of thing to do. And so, and maybe it isn't. I mean, I'm just sort of curious about it. Uh, we did talk about it. Um, it is a much smaller building, so and it, and it always was. So when you had the two, um, I'm just going to roughly say one was only 500 and the other was 1,000 at Audison. And so, um, so one scenario, rather than taking the sixth grade there, would be to take the cohorts from, from each. And, you know, the, the really interesting thing, I, the thing that struck me the most, where's your pointer? Yours is better. Um, the thing that struck me the most is when you look at these diagrams, is look where the hole is. Yep. That's where Gibbs is. Mm -hmm. So it was a very well thought out and planned community, you know, in terms of the schooling and the, the spaces and everything. So, um, but that is a good. That is a good thing. I mean, essentially, you would be creating a, a much smaller population um, because, again, without doing an addition, it's about a 500-ish student building. Yeah, it certainly is a policy uh, decision the board can make at a later date, whether to put a grade there or to, to zone it and split it. Um, rather than asking questions myself, I want to move things forward, so I'm going to invite any member of the Board of Selectmen right now who'd like to come up to the microphone to ask questions. Mr. Currow. Uh, why don't we get, uh, I know it's a little more complicated, but they're standing over there, so uh, we, can, we can work off of it this way. Uh, good evening, Mr. Curro. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, Joe Curro from the Board of Selectmen. Can I just first say how horrified I was to see that I'm at the peak of the demographic and right on the cliff of just sliding off into oblivion? <laughs> Bye, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, I have three quick questions, one for Dr. McKibben, one for the architect, and one for the superintendent. Uh, the first question is, um, <clears throat> you know, space, the space issue in this town doesn't just concern you know, public space and finding uh, space for our, our students and such. It's also, we're also kind of at the brink um, uh, with our, our uh, space for, for new construction. Mm -hmm. So the nature of new construction that you see here, much of it really isn't, isn't greenfield. What you'll see is uh, maybe an older home, a smaller home, will be uh, sold, will then be um, demoed, and then a larger home put in its place, um, which might be more attractive to a larger family, whereas the, the previous dwelling on that, on that, um, that lot was uh, perhaps more attractive to a single or, or a couple. Um, I was wondering if, if your um, models take that into account, the, the nature, or if, if there's a need to take that into account. Well, yes, we do, and you know, we've seen this a lot of the other districts in, in the Boston area too. You know, Needham, Wellesley, uh, Westwood, where you're you're pretty much built out. Yeah. You know, unless unless they actually do drain the swamp and build something there, that's, that's about the only big piece you've got left. But you know, it's it's infill, it's tear down and rebuild, yeah. it's it's things like that. So. Um, so the the number, of course, we look at. You know, I don't. I think you, you're not going to be able to probably sustain. 120 a year over the 10 years of the forecast. I have you at about 80. Uh, but of more concern to me is the price. Uh, there's, there's a great rule in demography. You can have money, you can have kids, but you can't have both. <laughs> as, as, income, I understand that. as income goes up, number of kids goes down, okay? It's one of our great chicken and egg questions. Are you wealthy because you have fewer kids? I, I prescribe to that one. Or do you have fewer kids because you're not as wealthy? It goes that way. So home price, you know, and it's, again, relative to the area, you know, um, a, a starter house in the Carolinas would be $250,000. Mm -hmm. A starter house up here is a half million. You know, so you have to, you know, judge this by the prices of the area. Mm -hmm. But 
if you know you go out and someone buys a nine hundred thousand dollar house, even around this area, you usually don't turn to your spouse and say, "Hey, hey let's have another kid." You know, you're you're pretty well booked out by then. But in a starter home, lower, more moderately priced, you're going to see more more uh, future births come out of that, or, or preschool age kids. So it's not just so much the number, but again, going back to the existing housing market, I'm looking more at price, I think, is, is the big determinant there. But for the record, I have you at 80 new housing units a year over the 10 years of the forecast, yeah. which is down from you're at now, but I think a good average for the 10 years. Okay, great, so. thank you. Um, one question for um, architects, for Laurie. Um, in your model uh, of adding a grade to the high school, hmm. does that take into account, does that assume that the current town office uses and the preschool stay in place, or does it presuppose that, that we would have to find solutions to those elsewhere? Uh, it, it doesn't go so far to presume one way or the other. I think yeah. that's part of the feasibility study that would need to happen with the, with the state when it started. I mean, it would be really looking at the, at that point, the functioning of the campus, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no answer yet on that one. Okay, Good question, though. Thank you. And lastly, to the, to the superintendent, um, I, I want to just address, I, I think, one of the elephants in the room right up front, because I think we'll hear it in public participation. Obviously, we know that um, you know, some of the, the tenants in, in the current Gibbs building, you know, all roads seem to be pointing to the Gibbs. I mean, it seems like the solutions are pointing that, that direction. There's a reason why, when I was on the school committee, we all voted to temporarily surplus that, that building, because we knew that it might be needed at some point. Um, but I was just wondering, one, I, I think in particular the Arlington Center for the Arts does have a, a um, history of partnerships with the school district um, and some of the fifth grade programming and such. They serve a lot of the same population. Um, I was just wondering if there have been any preliminary discussions or thought about potentially finding some win-win solutions, if, assuming we go down the Gibbs Road, where um, perhaps there could be some programmatic cooperation and allow that programming to continue in some, some fashion in cooperation with the schools under this model? I've had discussion within our conversations about that. We have not had any conversations mm -hmm. uh, specifically with um, the tenants for the Arlington Arts. However, my understanding is that most of the programming begins at 5 o'clock. Roughly, roughly there, and, I, and I, I would have to educate myself more about the specifics. I think it, it very, it's very possible. One of the things that is increasingly true about all of our schools is that we, they're in use much of time after the school bell at the end of the day. All of our elementary schools have after school programs that go to six o'clock and we have, um, certainly at the high school, we have the uh, community education programs and, and variety of other variety of other programs. Depending upon, here's the, the, here's the qualification, depending upon what the use of the Gibbs would be and how late we would need to have some of the, the school, whether we could work out some kind of partnership with, with, with the program is something I would be very open to, to looking in, into. I don't think there's any of us that really want to see these great tenants uh, not be able to have the space. The issue is that what do we do as alternatives um, as a town as we're grappling with this enrollment increase? Yeah. But um, certainly I would be very open to having very serious exploratory conversations about it. But it all depends on what we do. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all. Mr. Byrne. Thank you very much for having me. If uh, I was a comedian, I'd make a joke about Donald Trump and building a wall around Arlington. <laughs> but I'll leave the jokes to someone else tonight, I think. Um, I, I don't think I'm quite ready to uh, comment on the space planning schemes yet. That's certainly a lot to digest. Um, but one thing that keeps sticking out to me, and I feel like I'm kind of getting punched in the gut every time I hear it, is Thompson. And I hopefully think that um, I hope that moving forward we certainly take into account, uh, do a little bit better job planning for enrollment in, our, in the feasibility process because for a school that was just built, that is far, you know, that's not right. Um, and, and I don't mean to point fingers at anyone, and I know quite a bit of work went into that, but it, uh, it certainly doesn't uh, sit well with me. Um, and I do have one question for uh, Dr. McKibben. Um, so when you looked at the 
uh, projected numbers mm -hmm. for, versus the actual. There was, they were off by about 90 people. 86. 86, students. thank you. Yeah. So would that compound throughout the report? So that 86 is in this year. Would that throw off the numbers moving forward? Well, again, uh, almost all the error is, is in one grade, kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And again, kindergarten is the uh, cohort that has the highest amount of variability because not everybody goes to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. There's private kindergartens, things like that. And again, you're establishing a, a grade cohort versus a birth cohort. Mm -hmm. So that's why we like to look at first grade, which is only off by 20. Right. Next year, we go back and we still see that wide gap and that would have, would have now been first graders next year, then that would be a point of concern. Then an assumption's been violated, and your next year's kindergarten would also be low. That would uh, dictate then going back and doing a recalculation. But at this stage, it's within the 2% parameter, so I would say no at this point. But it's something we would definitely want to keep a look at for next year's evaluation. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I guess I'll finish by saying that I, I certainly look forward to seeing those numbers and I think uh, I know that we have to move fairly quickly and make uh, some decisions but I'll be very interested to see the outcome of that before we uh, jump any, into anything so thank you. Uh, before we go further I just want to note that when we do the Thompson or any other uh, project that involves uh, state reimbursement uh, they're setting a fairly strict set of rules. Uh, Dr. Bodie work with the state would you like to comment on that? I, I would. We at the time that we entered into the feasibility study with Thompson, um, our proposal was actually higher than the number that we finally settled at. Uh, we had proposed something more like 420. Um, but they had their own calculator and enrollment. And, and in fact, they didn't even think that we should have 380 as the number given their calculator. Uh, and and as part of the condition of having it at 380 as the number, we had to uh, we had to agree to do uh, redistricting, which is why we moved forward with redistricting process, which ended up with our buffer zones. So we were aware of it, but I don't think that the full at that time um, we were fully aware of where this enrollment growth was going. 420 would certainly have bought us more time for sure in that building, but if the number goes much higher than that, which is what the um, prediction is, the forecast is, I should say, that um, we would still need to add space on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Board of Selectmen, thank you. Uh, next up would be the Capital Planning Committee. Any members of the Capital Planning Committee would like to come to the microphone? Please do. Uh, from this point on, I'd like, uh, folks to just introduce themselves and their roles uh, going forward. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman, <clears throat> Chairman Schlickman. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Foskett, I'm Chairman of the Capital Planning Committee, and I was intrigued by uh, Dr. Seuss's comment that um, the uh, uh, consideration of a full middle school at the uh, Gibbs might solve a, a number of these problems. But we have in the uh, Gibbs School right now, not just the Arlington Center of the Arts, but we have four other very, including some town activities, very credible and worthy programs. And I'm wondering if the school department has or is intending to consider uh, how those programs get addressed. Uh, we are, I, I will speak uh, just as a chair, not as a result of the, uh, the, the uh, of a vote of the whole board, but we certainly do appreciate in very many ways the programs with the Gibbs. We've participated in many of them. We, we love them. Uh, we want them to th uh, survive and thrive. We have a problem in that it, it's sitting in a school building which was designated as a temporary uh, rental to preserve the space for possible future use so that we're within that context and if we do uh, end up going down the road where we need the Gibbs I think one of the things that we'd really be concerned about is maintaining the programs that are within the Gibbs right now. Um, if I may ask you another question. Go ahead. in the town. And right now it's under a great deal of uh, contention, and that's the uh, Mugar property. And I'm wondering if anybody's considering uh, the possibility of 
um, using that space either for uh, some of the community activities that take place in the Gibbs or in some other commercial or uh, uh, municipal public uh, negotiation, extracting, uh, let me call it, uh, some support from the proposed developers to create either academic facilities or community resources um, on that property. Uh, all of that sounds like a very good thinking. We did not go there. We did not get into um, acquiring other properties and how they might be used. I'm wondering if someone on the Board of Selectmen might comment on that. Mr. Curro. <laughs> <laughs> It's a simple answer. We have not discussed that possibility, but will you? He, I'm I'm always willing to discuss anything, Mr. Thank you. Foskey. You know. uh, anyone else from Capital Planning? Seeing none. Finance Committee, Mr. Tosti. Uh, Al Tosti, Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, I got three questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first for Dr. McKidden. I'm looking at chart one, permitted housing units. Uh, would I be correct in saying this data came from the building inspector? No, it would come from the Census Bureau's 404 website. Okay. What I was curious about is um, it, it includes permitted housing units, so those are new units. Yes, those are not building permits, but units. Sometimes an apartment will have one building permit but have 20 units in it. So that's why you might see a discrepancy in the numbers there. So it's not building permit, it's permitted units. Okay, I was wondering, for example, most of the housing in Arlington now is teardowns. Uh, you can't walk through East Arlington without seeing a teardown. So if a, if a two-family house is torn down and replaced with a duplex, does that mean we have two new units? You have uh, a net gain of zero. You have you've lost two units to demolitions and you've put a duplex in there with two more units so it's it's a, it's a net gain of zero so okay so i just wondered how that was going yeah. um okay my other questions are on the uh for Lori on the uh first of all i've noticed that one building school building was not at least i did not see it was not contemplated use of and that's the parmenter school granted it's a smaller school but it is, a, it is something that we might be able to use. Why was not that, look, that not looked at? I think you, I think you answered it uh, because of the size. I don't think it would fit a whole grade. I think it's pretty small. If, if Gibbs can fit a whole grade and it's much smaller than that, um, it would be a very small cohort of Okay, children. so it was just too small to have an impact. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, being from the Finance Committee, I immediate, my attention immediately was drawn to Scheme 3, uh, <laughs> because it was the lowest cost. <laughs> <laughs> so would I be correct in looking at this and saying it's going to add so-called permanent modular units to the Hardy, the Thompson, and the Audison. Mm. There would be no use of the Gibbs. Um, and there, but there'd be no permanent infrastructure added to the school system. No uh, permanent additions to the buildings. Right, they're looking, well, again, it's that definition of permanent. So they wouldn't be leased, you'd have to buy them. And then how you construct them and how uh, much money you put in them, in them to make them more solid, they would last longer. So the same sort of answer I was giving uh, earlier about uh, what would you do to make a modular construction uh, more lasting. So I think that's what we would be proposing for these because, again, the, the growth is there. Okay, so when you were looking at the, the cost estimates, you were thinking of well done so-called permanent modular Yes, additions. but I'll ask you not to call them a cost estimate. Okay. But it was <laughs> It, it seems to me the one problem in, in Scheme 3 is it still leaves some of the core areas of the Audison under strain. Very. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carmen. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Um, I have a few questions. The first one, I was looking at your total district enrollment, and I forget if you told me this was a projection or a forecast, so I guess I'll 
used them incorrectly. Um, you always see between eighth grade and ninth grade that there's a drop off in students because, and I'm assuming, you know, they're going to the local vote tech, they're going to private schools, etc. cetera. Um, as the population increases, how did you work with that, that drop off? And I guess my concern is just because Arlington's enrollment is increasing doesn't mean, let's say the local, the private schools are increasing. So did we slow it off? Because when I was just trying to do it on a percentage basis, I felt like it kept dropping. Well, usually in most school districts, you see an increase in ninth grade as private school kids come back to high school. So um, but in that yours gets it into isn't. parental choice. But in yours it isn't. Huh? But in yours it's not. No, you, you don't. And that's kind of a New England type thing. You'll, you'll see some kids go off to, again, you know, be VOTEC, private school, schools outside of the district and the like. Uh, that's parental choice. And I would never be so bold as to try to forecast parental thinking patterns. So I hold that constant at the same rate it's been the last five years. So the same rate yeah. meaning percentage attrition. Between same, same, same attrition rate. Just like your high school dropout rate, although it's minuscule compared to most school districts, I hold your dropout rate constant over the last five year average. Okay. But do you think, and I guess there's more Arlington specific, I guess we can talk about later, but we have a Catholic school in the town and we have the local vote tech. So I guess my concern there is we're assuming that a proportional increase to the local Catholic school would be mm -hmm. occurring as the town of Arlington is increasing. Or, or, or any, any private school. Um, again, that goes back to more of the economic factors. If you see unemployment rate kick up to like 8%, you're going to see fewer kids go to private school. I can guarantee you that. And we saw that back in 08, 09, and 10. And um, so that's, again, why the, why the economic parameters are so important. If you stay within these, these economic bounds for the economy chugging along, you know, being halfway decent, you can be pretty sure these proportions stay the same. But if um, the economy starts to boom, it may go the other direction as well. So you've, you've got to have bounds to, to look at. But unless your unemployment rate gets above 7%, I would look for a drag on a high number of a private school. They're, they're putting their kids at private school for a reason, and, and it's more emotional than financial in many cases, so. Okay, um, my second question, on the space planning schemes Appendix E, you had a column of kindergarten and classrooms, have need, have need. So I think in order to do that, you have to have a judgment on average class size mm -hmm. throughout, right? Cause, so how did you come up with that? Because I can't see the, sort of the underlying of it. Uh, I think that we basically, we, we capped out at 25 and, and the upper grades and the lower, I think for kindergarten was 22. Um, so it was just making a judgment. There is, there is flexibility. There's no actual cap as it stands right now. Um, so it's, it was just a range. So able, you know, and that's going to fluctuate. So you might have, you know, again, a, a larger cohort. So if we say you have three kindergartens, you're going to need four, you may still have one of those four with, you know, 23 kids. I mean, I'm just using numbers here, but that's that flexibility is in there. Right. But so to understand what you're saying, so in order to come up with the rejection, you came with an average class size of 22 in the lower grades, 25 as they move to the upper grades. Correct. Got it. Um, my third question is, um, when you were talking about the Gibbs, you made a comment that it could fit one grade, but it couldn't probably fit two grades. So I guess I was thinking in my head as I was looking at the out years that the average class would be about 500 students. So you're saying it could fit 500, but it couldn't fit 1,000. So what do you think the capacity of the Gibbs is, just when um, you were looking at it? So, so we did do... Um, yeah some diagrams which are on the web in the full packet of just where classrooms would be um, at Gibbs, just to give a classroom count. And we had a classroom count of 24 general classrooms, still allowing for music, art, and so on. The gymnasium's already there, uh, you know, reworking and having a cafeteria and so on. Um, so I'm not sure I can specifically answer your question because I think that it's, it's uh, somewhere, I can't remember the numbers, I'm trying to picture my piece of paper. I think you probably could be up to like 600. Um, so if you said, I mean, I can't do the math in my head, 24 times 25, whatever that number is, sorry. I did it, but I just don't have it the number in my head right now. So that's, you know, it starts to max out at that point, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, the last thing I guess would be a comment, and um, I would, 
I would like to thank the superintendent, the school administration, and the school committee for hosting this forum. I think, um, I think it's very easy to sit in school administration on the top floor in the, you know, the school committee chambers and, and have a limited number of people and less accountability to, to the townspeople. When I look at the people that are standing up here, and I'm sure that some of them will, when we get to the general public, might even start throwing tomatoes at you, that um, it, 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 this is a more difficult path, but I think it's a better path. So I do you know, thank each and every one of you for hosting this forum. Um, I think it's a great thing. Thank you. Hi, uh, Len Carden from the Finance Committee. Um, just a couple of quick questions. So in the, in the past, we've had um, some issues similar to this uh, handled by the School Facilities Working Group. I wonder if there's been any thought about having that group uh, be involved in this process. I, I think this is a major issue that we're dealing with. So we'll probably want to put together a task force uh, that would probably be derived from the groups that are uh, involved in this, uh, the selectmen, capital planning, finance, school committee, so on. Uh, similar to the, uh, uh, we have a facilities planning committee exists right now, uh, Dr. Bodie? Within, within the school department. Uh, within the town. Um, not, not really. Uh, Mr. Chapelain and I were, uh, have talked about this mm -hmm. and we both collectively recommend putting together a task force, probably as a subgroup of one of the existing committees such as the budget task force committee. Mm -hmm. But I think this is such a town issue, there's no one group mm -hmm. that can solve this. It's something we have to solve together. Great, thanks. Lori, a question for you. You I mean, talking about the elementary forecast, you, you said something about it, it being permanent, but if you look at the actual forecast, you know, for 2015-16, for the forecast is 3,032. We're a little bit below that, but that's the forecast. And then in 2024-25, it's 3,033, almost exactly the same. There is a wave, but doesn't it, doesn't it come back down? Mm -hmm. okay. Agreed. So, so I guess I, I, I just want to be clear as to whether it's a permanent wave or a temporary wave, or we're not certain yet, but it may be a temporary wave at the elementary level that we're already in. Granted, we're already overcrowded. Um, and then also the, the specialist space that you looked at, do you, do you have a more detailed analysis of that? I'm, well, I have a lot of chicken scratch. I haven't drawn anything like what's on the website in the full okay. report. Um, but I, I but briefly, you know, very quickly today when the report went up, I did go through the diagrams and I counted, you know, based on my knowledge of some of the schools, you know, basically up to 14 classrooms that could possibly, I don't know what all they're being used for, but 14 classrooms across the district that could possibly be made available if other spaces could be found for those specialists. Yeah. So, I mean, that's almost a whole school. So I think that's something we really need to look at. We still have the issue of the students are in the wrong place, but we may have spaces elsewhere for those students to, to move classes if needed temporarily. Um, and then one last thing, the, um, the one sort of obvious permutation that I think was missing was option one, scheme one, but with an eight to 12 configuration at the high school. And so I wonder if, if we could consider that as well, just throw that in the mix. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, we're now to the Permanent Town Building Committee. Are there any members of the PTBC who'd like to question? Mr. Cole. Good evening, uh, John Cole, Chair of the Building Committee. Uh, I'd like to applaud the efforts that have gone on to look at a broader planning process of, you know, is the Gibbs suitable, is the Parmenter available, blah, blah, blah. And I would encourage to widen it a little further. My question is, could the town planning department identify uh, parcels of a suitable size within the town or parcels that could be assembled that might help to solve the larger space issues? either for an educational facility or an offloading space to take some of the community activities out of Parmenter or Gibbs to give them a home and let the school sites become school buildings again. I don't know who that question is directed to. I guess mm -hmm. that <laughs> that Mr. Chapdelaine, yeah. I, I, I'm, pret I'm, I'm pretending to be the moderator, you know? <laughs> I can throw the question anywhere I want. 
I, I think, um, you know, in cooperation with uh, whatever task force is formed, that, that would be an absolutely recommendable path for the planning department to, to undertake. Thank you. Anyone else from Permanent Town Building Committee? Redevelopment Board will be next. Anyone from Redevelopment? Uh, okay, the question's been asked. Thank you very much. That is wonderful. Um, the moderator is the first town meeting member. Would you like to ask a question? <laughs> I, I saw the projections of cost. Uh, name and precinct, oh. please. John, <laughs> John Leone, town moderator, precinct eight. <laughs> I'm used to sitting up there. <laughs> I saw the projections of the cost for these um, either temporary modules, permanent modules, anywhere from 11 million, and if we build something, 30 million. Maybe you said it, but are any of these things reimbursable by the state, or is this all coming out of our budget? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, how it's working right now with MSBA, they do one project at a time. So while we are in, engaged in the, our statement of interest to the MSBA for the high school, they would not consider anything else until that project was underway. And how long it would take, how many years it would take to be considered, I don't know. Now, I, I know that Brookline that's doing some additions, they have, they've had to do the queuing as well in terms of whether they could get reimbursement. I, I don't know currently what the final decision was. We could always do it. It's just that it's so far down the road that it's not probably a viable alternative. So effectively, we're going to have to pay for these out of our budget. That's probably correct. Or a debt exclusion. Are they, bond they are bondable? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that's all. Thank you. Uh, just uh, as, a, as a comment on that, I think one of the attractions of putting the eighth grade into the high school building is that you'd be adding that into a reimbursable project. Uh, so that, that would be a consideration in terms of the cost to the town. If the state becomes engaged in the process and decides, yeah, you've got more than a high school problem and we're willing to help you out here. I'm to jump here. Go ahead, yeah. So we haven't submitted enough to the state on the high school that it's still open enough to add the eighth grade into it. Yeah. Uh okay. May I? Go ahead. We actually included that in our statement of interest as a possibility to consider in a feasibility study in both the first and the second one. Um, and right now, we, we have been elevated to a senior study, and we're going to be, um, the MSBA is going to be coming out to the high school to, to have a working meeting. So I, I don't know if it, what that quite means. It just means they're now taking much more notice of our, our statement of interest. And then if you're planning for the high school, if it included the eighth grade, would it be within the main building or would they be in their own little separate area? That would be all part of the feasibility study, what it would look like. Um, okay. it probably, I've done some preliminary discussion with the high school principal and one thought might be to have an eight, nine institute and then a 10, 12. So the thing is that it would be, there would be a lot of permeability because we have students that take upper level courses Course. as freshmen. Um, the, the issue with this is timing. Let's say hypothetically we were invited into the first phase just this year. The earliest that we would be able to have eighth grade at the, at the high school site would be 21, September 21. And if you look at the diagrams, so we're going to have to handle on a short, if we did this, we'd have to handle on a short term basis this growth for at least five years. Um, so it's almost too late. Well, it's, it's going to hit its peak. It's going to hit its peak then, uh, mm -hmm. just when they would be coming here. But what we don't, what we can say is it's probably going to stay fairly high relative to now for the years after that as well. Because when you see that chart, and you look in the second 10 years, I mean the second five of the 10 years, you still see gro growth at the, uh, at the Addison Middle. Mm -hmm. okay. Not as much, but it's, it's, still, it's still, well, it's, it's growing. Right. So it's, some of this is timing issues, and, and what's going to make this a puzzle, I, it, um, using that word is a good description because there's so many, uh, there's so many parts of this you don't, you, you're working with 
unclear information in terms of, well, are we going to be accepted this year or is it going to be another year? And all of that has timing issues with respect to this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next portion would be for town meeting members. This is the way we're going to do it. Um, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald is going to put a sign-up sheet at each podium. I'm going to ask people to line, uh, town meeting members at this point to line up at the two podiums. While you're waiting to speak, please put your name on the sign-in sheet. Uh, I'm going to ask the uh, experts um, to use the portable mic so we'd have the uh, podiums free. So any town meeting members who'd like to ask a question, uh, you can please line up at the two uh, podiums and I'll, and I'll alternate. I'm going to try to keep this down to a three minute limit and questions and answers in order to get us to the point where we can uh, get everyone who wants to have a chance to speak, uh, ask a question to do so. So uh, we'll start with the gentleman here, name and precinct. Steve Liggett, precinct nine, a proud Thompson parent. Mm -hmm. Um, I had uh, three questions. The third one was already covered around the high school uh, plan, so I won't go there. Mm -hmm. um, but I wondered if there was any consideration of building vertically. You talked about the options of adding uh, adjoining walls, but I don't recall anything about vertical additions and wondered if that was included. Um. In, in all the scenarios, the additions are multi-story additions. That's one thing, just maybe it wasn't clear. Um, in terms of vertically meaning on top of what's existing in there, um, that would require sort of structural analysis of whether something could handle it and so on. And we did not get to that level in, in any of these. But in the case of the six classrooms at each of the elementary schools, they would be three stories. Okay. Um, so so I'm thinking specifically about the Thompson, which was just built, and yep. I know you were heavily involved, and thank you. <laughs> um, is there, structurally, was it uh, designed so that there could be a fourth floor, given that that was in the initial plan, as I, under, as I recall? No, it was designed to have six classrooms extended off the end. That's where the expansion was planned for. It was not planned to go up even higher. Okay. Um, my second question is probably not, well, I don't know who it's for, uh, so Mr. Moderator will redirect. <laughs> I wondered, given the Vision 2020 and the discussion about the possible overhauling of the zoning bylaws, if any changes in zoning were included in the uh, forecast. I, I just note the master planning is primarily uh, directed at the commercial business district at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. If they're looking at rezoning or changing the zoning bylaws, I could imagine a world where your two-family uh, zone for two-family could shift to zone for three-family, and that could have a pretty substantial or might have an impact on the enrollment and growth. Yeah, town meeting uh, has the power to rezone uh, at the recommendation of the redevelopment board often, but the study and the proposals of the redevelopment board are working on right now are strictly in terms of master plan for business districts, uh, primarily focused along Mass Ave Broadway uh, and not looking at uh, substantive changes in the zoning bylaw to increase density for residential use. Okay, mm -hmm. good. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next, uh, name and precinct, please. Uh, Bill Moyer, Precinct 10, a town meeting member. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Schlickman, great job taking a, uh, what's going to be a, another very emotional issue in managing this forum very well. So Thank you. Um, for, so the first question is the, the projections were done based on permitted units. So my understanding is the Mugard, potential Mugard development is not yet permitted, so that's not included in your projections, correct? Correct. Okay. That I can um, <laughs> Good. Have you looked at demographic changes, you know, how the town, as the town changes the education levels, income levels, and their impacts on public, parochial, vocational educations, and how that would affect the projections? No. Okay. Um, Real quick on that, 
you can do what we call scenario forecasts. We do a lot of those where they've built um, new auto plants or a steel mill shut down. They changed zoning law or something. What would be the impact if X, Y, or Z changed? We just did a host of those for Needham. They had three different variables I want to look at, you know, interest rates, things like that. You can do that scenario forecast. It has to be very specific, and that's what you're trying to measure on top of it. Um, but as a rule, again, we hold everything constant because we're trying to identify your demographic changes, not, not policy or administrative changes or zoning changes or whatever. So would it have an impact? Yes. But is it in the, in the forecast? No, it's not. It's like draining the swamp and building the housing uh, divisions out there. Yeah. If they're building it, I'd put them in. But until they do that, it's just someone thinking about it. It would have an impact, but I'm not, I'm not going to include it. Okay. Um, do you have any data? Uh, I'm, I'm an engineer, right? So everything I do has to have a min and a max. It can't just work where I'd like it to be. It has to work over all possibilities. Do you have any minimum and maximum uh, projections? Like, like what yields, the range could yields be? for new housing units? Uh, for population in the final numbers. Well, yeah, but it's, it's not just by household. Is it, is it an owner? Is it by a renter? Are they people in their 20s, 30s, 40s? Uh, what's their income level? You know, you could use one set like yield factor for an area, but you're, you miss so many of the unique demographic characteristics of the individual areas uh, by, by overgeneralizing. So uh, for each area, yeah, we have a, a basic yield, and the ones we use are for renter and for owner are the two basic ones, and then also another one for income level. But they're different for each one of your attendance areas. Okay. Um, and another question. That and a quick wrap up. Excuse me. Okay. A quick wrap up. Final last question for the um, the programs that are at the Gibbs. And this probably goes to town manager. Do we know are they paying market rates above below market rates? What are you, you know, do we have any ideas? Anybody looked at that? Mr. Chapdoy. I would say in general they're paying below market rate. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mr. Peluso. Name and precinct. My name is Ted Peluso. I'm a town meeting member, and I actually have a, a couple of comments before I ask the only one question that I have. Uh, first of all, comment number one. Everybody in here, this place looks very sad. <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> growing population, growing young people in a town is good. It's not bad. Otherwise, you become the retirement community of the Boston area. So <laughs> smile about it a little bit. Uh, sticking with my comments, uh, we have a very strong real estate market in this town. And one of the reasons why you have a very strong re real estate market is because you have a very fine school system. So, okay. So look at, the, look at the long range and see whether or not these four alternatives you're presenting, which I think you're missing five and six to tell you the truth. Uh, if you looked at these four alternatives, I'm not so sure they're gonna help keep the values of your real estate. I personally, uh, although I'm not planning to have any new, new children, <laughs> But you never know, my wife can't be sure about that. Uh, in any, I checked with her, she said no. Uh, I'll, I'll never tell. I, 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 I sort of don't like, at the end of the day, that you wind up with a 100-year-old building with the Gibbs. It was built in 1928. So you wind up with a hundred year old building that I'm gonna buy a house in this town to send my kids to a 100 year old building? I'm not so sure. No matter what you do with uh, the renovations, right? I don't like the idea if I read it right, that high school's online? Is, is that what I'm reading here that at some point high, because you said something about high school online. Well, okay, then, then ignore That's that. That's just my terminology. Because, you know, very, high school is very important to all of us. How else are we going to become the nasty people that we are, right? So, 
You don't believe it, huh? <laughs> so the question is very simple. Why wasn't there an analysis in this, analysis in this report on actually building something new? I want to tell you that I took a look at a couple of numbers and from the uh, Gibbs schools, you collect something like $330,000 a year in rental. You spend very little to keep it going. Uh, I have a feeling you might be. I take art classes there, it's a wreck, okay? It's true. So the question is, so you're giving up the 325 or 30,000, which you might even be able to increase because that's the easy thing to do. So maybe a little long range planning in this thing might work. So that's my real question. Why aren't you considering an alternative where you actually do new construction of some sort? And if you think that's completely off the table, then that's fine. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, can I, can oh, I Kathy? That? Yeah. It, it's a great question. Um, it's not that it didn't enter into our mind. It was, it was how are we going to deal with the next five to ten years? And the assumption we made was that and, and is that the high school is the first priority. And in that scenario, um, if you were going to build a brand new building, I think that the, as the town, what? Hmm. what? Oh. Uh, no, 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 I'm just saying that we did think about it and, I'm, and, and it's something the town could consider, but I think that it would be um, an issue that we would have to, Mr. Chaplain? Do you want to? No. no. Oh. You want to go next? Okay. Oh, oh I see. Um, it, it's, it's something that we, if we went to a new building, we'd want to engage with M, the Massachusetts Building Authority and for reimbursement. If the high school is the first priority, it's down the road. We were trying to look at the scenarios that we're going to solve our problems in the next five and then ten years. And that that's choice probably would be much further down the road. Mr. Chaptoin. I, I just I couldn't let it go going unanswered. The, the, the Gibbs is not free to operate. We probably clear about $30,000 a year. So I think it's irresponsible mm -hmm. to, to suggest that it's just a cash cow that mm -hmm. costs nothing to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, hello. Hi. Name and precinct, please. Tanuta Forbes, Precinct 10. Um, just at the last town meeting, we saw projected budgets of cuts in the school budget. So I'm kind of wondering what you think about all this money that we're going to need to spend, and then we're going to vote on cutting the budget next year, so I want to ask about that. And then the other question I had for Lori is, what about just think ge thinking geographically? If you're going to use the Gibbs gym, maybe using having Thompson, Hardy, and Bishop maybe have like a that they would use that for their middle school, sort of like the old east-west, um, which would probably, so people could kind of walk to school since they, they do anyway. So that was one of the ideas I had. Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, that was the idea of, you know, one, one of your middle schools would be 1,000 students, the other would be a 500, and what would that breakout look like? So it's similar in one of these scenarios, it's just not, it's just what cohorts are they pulling into that building? Mm -hmm. So okay. it would be similar. Yeah. And I don't know if Mr. Chaplain wants to address the budget issue, um, the projections that you presented at town meeting. I, I, I guess the best I can say is the school department budget went up over 5% last year, so I didn't see any budgetary reductions for the school department in FY16. Uh, I'm talking about two, 2017. There were some projected... It's, pro, it's projected, we, we it's, it's projected to go up more than 5% cumulatively each of the next five years throughout the long-range plan. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Any more town meeting members? Thank you. At this point, we're going to line up uh, members of the public. By the way, if you're a member of the public and not a town meeting member and you aspire to be one,
It's not hard. You go to the town clerk's office, uh, you get a pet nominating petition, you get 10 signatures, you bring it back to the clerk's office. By the end of January, your neighbors vote for you, and now you can sit in this hall in the spring and make some of these decisions. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, again, Ms. Fitzgerald is going to put... Uh, uh, please make sure you write your name on the sheet because we need to have a record of this. We'll be coming alternately left to right. Uh, Mr. Garbley first, would you like to say something? No, he's very happy sitting up. Well, say hello. Okay. The only thing I, I will say is we appreciate this public forum. We appreciate having this conversation. Uh, your delegation will work extremely close with the mm -hmm. Board of Selectmen, the school committee, all parties, the town manager. Mm -hmm in working with MSBA to make sure that we are united in, in moving forward. And I, I pledge we'll work as hard as we can as we did in rebuilding the Thompson as we are in trying to reach an agreement with MSBA and rebuilding Arlington High. And we'll continue to do so. Uh, the town manager and I had a conversation about this afternoon uh, before this meeting. We'll continue to have many more and we'll work extremely hard as a delegation uh, to make sure MSBA uh, hears our thoughts as the superintendent uh, acknowledged earlier, we worked to get MSBA to come out to Arlington High for a working meeting. We're going to have many of these conversations in the future. So thank you for having this meeting. Thank you. Uh, we're going to ask for name and address, and I will uh, try to play Jeopardy because we haven't decided anything. So uh, questions are probably the best venue for this. And uh, I'm going to gently uh, nudge you when we hit three minutes. So first to my left. Great. Sharon Shalo, uh, Precinct 8. I feel like I should be a town member, but I've been former member of the Arlington Cultural Council, current member of Tourism and Economic Development. Mm -hmm. As I said, Precinct 8 ably represented a town meeting by many other people um, waiting in line to get a seat. Um, I had a question, I guess, about ed policy. Um, it, nowhere in the, it, it seems that the, the given here is K to five. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you thought about the K to three intermediate four to six model, and then seven and eight in an institute at the high school down the line. It strikes me that separating seven and eight seems really odd considering where the old frameworks used to go and where, where I think Common Core is, that mm -hmm. those seem to be a unit. So I was wondering, and I'm not saying it solves the problem, I think there's a real problem here, but it seemed that these divisions were very strange. So I was just wondering what the thought was about, you know, rethinking how students are grouped at our various schools. And um, that was my main question. The other one, though, was about the high school. It strikes me as a better solution to have seven and eight in an institute and nine through 12 in the school, and I was wondering if that's on the table. Mm. I mean, we're playing with all the options. That's all I can but say. None but none of these scenarios um, got away from the K to 12 model. So I wondered if the fundamental thing is still the neighborhood school K to 5 model, or if we're looking at other ideas. I mean, we'll, we're open to playing with any of the configurations that we'll fit into. Uh, to the right. Good evening. My name is Linda Shoemaker, 35 Warren Street. I am the executive director of the Arlington Center for the Arts. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the Gibbs Building. The Gibbs Building has been home to the Arlington Center for the Arts, the Leslie Ellis School, the Learn to Grow Preschool, and the Kelleher Center for Adults with Disabilities for 27 years. On behalf of all of us, we thank the school committee for the opportunity to address you in your October meeting, and certainly heartened by the conversation and the support for our or organizations in the room. But I didn't want, we didn't want to let this evening pass without speaking up about the major loss to our town if we lose these organizations and these services. The Gibbs organizations are not merely tenants. Over the course of nearly 30 years, we have become part of the fabric of this town. I'll speak particularly about the Arlington Center for the Arts. Since 1988, we have served and enriched the lives of tens of thousands of people in this community. ACA has become an integral part of our community, an essential resource for our kids, teens, adults, seniors, artists, Ted Peluso, <laughs> and all of us who want a vibrant, vibrant and creative community life. At the core of our mission, we share with the school committee a commitment to our youth. 
We are committed to arts education and youth development through the arts. This year alone, we had over 1,000 campers in February, April, and summer vacation arts programs. Hundreds more participating in arts classes, exhibits, including 80 students right now today who have artwork on display at the State House as part of our fifth grade Images of Arlington partnership with the schools. For teenagers, ACA provides leadership, um, leadership development and a counselor and training program, which for many Arlington teens uh, leads them to their first jobs as, as camp counselors at our, at our program. Hundreds more teens take part in art classes, exhibits, a Friday night teen clubhouse, and a brand new LGBTQ program that just started this spring. ACA is also home to the Ar Arlington Children's Theater and to the LARP After School Program, both beloved community youth organizations serving hundreds more kids and families in our town. All of these students have found a home at ACA, a place where it's normal, where it is celebrated to be creative, to do art, to sing, to dance, and to be different. And we need that in our town. We know. I know you agree with me about how important it is for our creative kids to feel like they have a place where they belong in our community. And the Arlington Center for the Arts is not just about kids. ACA is also part of what makes Arlington an attractive place to live. Shakespeare in the Park, Arlington Open Studios, free community theater, gallery exhibits, a vibrant and active artist studio community. These classes, camps, programs for adults and kids, these are the very kinds of things that are attracting people to our town. These are some of the very reasons families are moving here now. Our town would most certainly be diminished. The opportunities we offer to our families and children would be diminished without the Arlington Center for the Arts. And I just want to wrap up. We recognize the challenges the school committee that we're all facing for meeting the needs of our growing student population. But we ask that as you deliberate, you seek out a solution that will accommodate the increasing enrollment and still preserve the Arlington Center for the Arts and our fellow organizations who call the Gibbs Building home and serve so many Arlington families and children. Thank you. Thank you, and we, wel uh, we will welcome you next month and so we can have a, a longer discussion with you. Um, to my left, uh, is everybody signing in on the sheet too? Yeah. Uh, there, there's no, no sheet? Oh. Okay. Okay, um, Kristen Chalmers, um, I am in, I don't know what district I'm in. Okay, just, uh, Stratton. What street, what street so I just jotted a few things down, but I want to rethink, as I heard from the Arlington Center from the Arts, being a former dancer and now a working photographer, to take away from the arts, to get rid of Arlington Center for the Arts would be a travesty. But I am here as a com concerned parent of a town that I love. I'm not from here, I moved here. Arlington is a town where people from Boston and Cambridge basically come to breed. They come to have children. <laughs> <laughs> they love the small town charm, but yet so close to a major city. Mm -hmm. I like to say that Arlington is not a suburb, but a town of Boston. Mm -hmm. And that being said, if we do not address this problem of overcrowding and overspending, we will have... Thanks. We will have a huge disaster on our hands. It will affect property values. It will affect how our children are educated. It will affect a lot of things. First of all, I know that it was discussed about the Hardy reconstruction and that it was built basically to capacity, but I still, I have questions about that. I cannot believe that something like that was approved. Um, as far as the suggestions presented today, I'm not sure who came up with the idea to mix eighth grade with a high school, but that sounds like a ticking time bomb to me. Stratton, parents fought like mad to eliminate moving forward by putting the fourth and fifth grades at the Audison. So I'm not sure about finding parental support with people on board putting eighth grade into a high school, especially with technology and I could go on and on about that. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> um, I do think that putting sixth grade at the Gibbs and leaving everything else alone is maybe the most cost effective solution without possible permanent modules at the elementary school. While option four is not a bad idea, I would hate to rob children of a fifth grade experience. My son, who is on the spectrum, is thriving in a fifth grade, feeling strong and like he owns the school. I would hate to rob him of that. 
It's very important. I lived for fifth grade. Middle school stinks no matter what you do. <laughs> um, maybe Mr. Seuss's idea is really one we need to look at. The Gibbs gym was a high school, a junior high school before. Why not make that again? Another thought is, can we put sixth grade back into the elementary schools? Is that an op is that an option? That's just because we're too crowded. I, I know there's no room, but like, what if we put? modules in and put sixth grade there? I don't know, these are just suggestions. I mean, I know this is an incredibly hard and difficult decision for everybody, and it, it's very emotional for everybody, but I just felt like if I didn't say anything, I would kick myself when I got home. So, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and the, uh, to my right. Okay. So I'm Stephanie Marlin Curiel. I'm on the Arlington Commission yeah, of now. Arts and Culture. <laughs> Um, for those of you who do not know what the commission is, um, we uh, advocate and preserve cultural and artistic resources in town and advise the Board of Selectmen on all matters, arts and culture. So um, we recognize that this is not and cannot be a contest between education and the arts. I mean, we cannot pit you know, the uh, Arlington Center for the Arts against the schools. We have to come up with a solution that accommodates both. Both, the arts are part of the education and we all know how important that creativity and innovation will be for our children in their future that they're facing. Um, it's already been said that the growing popularity of Arlington as a place to live is due to the quality of our schools and also the quality of our cultural life. Um, and we do not want to lose either one of those. Um, this is a problem that we're facing together and that we have to solve together. And the ACA must be part of the equation in terms of coming up with solutions, including the costs that are projected for these solutions. And in, as to the question of state funds, there are state funds that are available uh, for cultural facilities, so perhaps uh, we could look at those. Um, the Arlington Center for the Arts, uh, uh, everything that it's offered, as Linda said, uh, of course the loss of those would be um, extremely detrimental to, to our town as well as, as, well as what uh, the other Gibbs um, uh, organizations are offering. The Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture was created in part to the groundswell of enthusiasm and momentum in the arts in this town in recent years. And, um, and so, we, we're recognizing that there is an untapped creativity and the cultural resources that we have in town that could be capitalized on and to strengthen our businesses and enhance quality of life for everyone. And this includes helping to raise much needed revenue that could in turn support our schools. So the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture is taking a specific step that I mention here because it pertains to the Arlington Center for the Arts and that we are trying to apply for cultural district status from the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Cultural Council. And this is a you know, recognition of the state um, that would be applied to our town. Um, the goals, uh, well, it, the a cultural district is recognizes that our town is very walkable, that it's compact, and that it has a density of arts and culture resources. Um, and the goals of districts are that they attract artists and cultural em um, enterprises, they encourage business and job development, establish a district as a tourist destination, they enhance property values, and foster local cultural development. And in order to apply for, for cultural district status, we need to have a managing partnership. Arlington Center for the Arts is key to that managing partnership. They have already agreed, with, along with a number of other key organizations in town, to take on that role. And they, given their, their experience in managing an arts and cultural institution with very diverse uh, range of activities happening inside it, um, that they are you know, uniquely qualified to help in the managing of, of this district and to help move Arlington forward in the arts. I just want to mention, um, kind of in closing, that, that there's a quote from Woody Dumas, who's a former mayor of Baton Rouge, that the arts are the best insurance policy a city can take on itself. And as we know, Boston has also enhanced, uh, has taken on, uh, hired an arts and culture czars and, cu and investing in a cultural plan. Um, and the ACAC is also um, helping Arlington to do the same in cooperation and huge support from the town and the Board of Selectmen, for which we are grateful for, um, for that commitment. And, um, okay. Thank you very much.
Thank you. <laughs> and to my left. Hello, my name is Jean Clark, and I live at Ridge Street, um, mm -hmm. Precinct 11. I have mm -hmm. a daughter, class of 2025. That mm -hmm. sounds like a futuristic novel. And I have a son, class of 2027. Mm -hmm. And um, I also happen to be a member of the class of 1991. All right. And whatever. So there you go. Um, historical context I want to provide for some folks here, which we're diminishing in numbers, is that Arlington in 1980 had 11 elementary schools and two junior highs and a high school. And then in 1990, that number was shifted down to four. Um, we lost four elementary schools. The Gibbs closed and we're down to the high school. I mean, obviously. So that's where we are now. And it's amazing that was a 10 year blip. And so those folks who their you know, kids were leaving the nest and based on the McKibben projections and they were 55, surprise, surprise, 20, 25 years later, they're selling their houses. So this is really a big shock, I hope not, considering, you know, people do projections. But anyways, um, I guess the point I'm trying to make, or the question I have, I feel sorry for the folks here because 20, 30 years ago, I'm pretty sure you guys were thinking about different things. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the folks that were in your position made some really bad decisions. So I think it was short-sighted at the time to have sold off schools. They sold off the lock and they sold off the cutter. Okay, small parcels, yes. But where did that money go when they sold that off? I'm curious, because that would have been nice if it was put in a nest egg for this current issue. And then the rents we've been getting at Parmenter and Crosby all these years, wouldn't it have been nice if they were maybe saved for like, I don't know, the cycle? Because Arlington's not Detroit. It's not like we've lost housing units. We, we physically have not lost structures. In fact, we've increased. So one would assume that the population would go up again, and here we are. So the question I have is, um, I would love to see the McKibben report, I don't know if it's gonna cost more money, but it had a lot of data, but not, the analysis that was spoken this evening was great, but it wasn't in the report, and so as someone who couldn't come to this meeting and reading the report, and I'm looking, I'm like, I got data, methodology, no analysis, no conclusion, um, and it would be interesting to see that information. I know that there are no land parcels available in this community. I did a zoning project when I was in graduate school for this, and there, there's really very limited land. So why did we sell off the Crosby in 2012 for $2.9 million? Now, Schools for Children is a great program, like all these other great programs we have in this great community, but, and I'm glad to see them still here, but it would have been nice if we had maybe thought about that space. And I agree with, I don't know how you pronounce your name, but I agree with every comment this older gentleman over here made. Um, about the rebuilding, but I also know that the high school's an issue. And I just, I really wanna know where the money's going because it's permanent town building, um, the buildings are under the permanent town building committee, but they were schools. And so, like, there's a reason our forebears built these schools for this community. And I love that my kids can walk to their school and I would hate to see if this community was broken up into an area where people couldn't walk to their schools. And that is pretty much probably it. I'm sure some other thoughts will be repeated. Thank okay, you for the thank time. You. <laughs> Come on. Hi. Yeah, hi. My, oh, we're sharing our time. My name is Nancy Morrison. I live at 56 Claremont Avenue. I'm president of the Arlington Children's Theater, and we're here to round out the hat trick on arts, pro arts groups. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Lundin. I'm the artistic director of Arlington Children's Theater. Um, so I just quickly have a few things to say about Arlington Children's Theater and what we do here in the Arlington community. Um, so like I said, we are a children's theater and we do about uh, nine productions a year, also summer camps as well as April and February vacation camps. Uh, so throughout the year, we work with about 500 kids um, and 70% of that number is Arlington kids. Um, we also uh, go out into the schools in Arlington. Uh, I myself currently this uh, started this week teaching after school workshops at Brackett, Pierce, and Bishop, as well as, um, for me, I'm also a TA at Hardy uh, Elementary, and I was also a TA at Stratton Elementary while I was finishing my master's. So I totally understand where you're all coming from as far as space issues. Um, but tonight, I have to come from the point of view of my full-time job, which is artistic director of this children's theater. Um, the kids involved, uh, all 500 of them are diverse in every way, um, including those on the spectrum, as well as um, 
kids that I work closely with going through issues of gender identity as well as um, sexual identity and all of that. Um, so I just want to hit on, for, for that group, ACT is a peer group, a community, and a safe place where they are accepted for who they are. Um, for the kids, the community of ACT is more important and life-changing to them than the acting they do. ACT has been a part of this community for 25 years. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Um, and I myself have been with the organization for 10. And for 17 of those years, we were nomadic. We were in church basements. And we finally found a spot at the Arlington Center for the Arts and for the last seven years have been working there um, with rehearsals and productions. Um, so now with that, I turn it over to Nancy. So the reason we're talking about this tonight is because we have so many, of, so many members of other town committees, councils, and offices because we really think that the Gibbs Building is Arlington's current art center. It's affordable theater and rehearsal space for the performing arts and it's space for artist studios, classes, and camps. Um, Arlington needs an art center. If the Gibbs reverts to becoming a school, then I think actually it's up to the town of Arlington to work together, not just the school committee, but all of the committees and councils in Arlington to work together to provide an art center, to help provide space for art, not to necessarily fund the programs, but to fight a, provide a space. I've been, thank you. I've been thinking about this, and the best analogy I can come up with is Title IX. Title IX made it so that women's sports were funded in an equal manner as men's sports. So I'm sort of thinking this as Title IX point one, that maybe recreation should be funded and art should be funded in the same way. The town currently provides space for athletes fields for baseball and soccer, basketball courts, tennis courts, an ice rink for hockey, playgrounds for children, space for our seniors to gather and learn, and a library for everyone. The town's doing a wonderful job. The town, through the school committee, has been providing an art center as well, and we've deeply appreciated that. So we really think that this is a town issue, that we need to have an art center. Um, Arlington Children's Theater would love to work with the schools or with the town on multi-purposing space because we only operate at night. So we'd love to use empty rooms that are used by someone else during the day. Um, and we hope that you'll think about Title IX.1 and giving equal opportunity for arts as we do for athletics. Um, I also wanted to address the Mugar Enterprises in the past, Mugar Foundation has provided funding for th various theaters in the Boston area. Their foundation is no longer doing that. They have a different focus. However, Mugar Enterprises owns four or five theaters in the Boston area, so there is a precedent for them actually building and operating the professional theater spaces. And so that might be something that's worth looking into. Thank you. Adam Street. One of the um, previous speakers alluded to the mistake the town made of selling the Crosby School a few years ago. If I remember right, the um, agreement was that should the current owner decide to sell, the town has the right of first refusal. Has anyone approached the owner about repurchasing that school? No. Okay. Another question I had was in doing the space analysis, was, the, was one of the constraints that there would not be redistricting? Done again? No. No. Okay. Then I guess I didn't understand the answer regarding the Parmenter School. And another speaker mentioned the possibility of having K through six elementary school. And the answer was that you couldn't have, you couldn't reuse the Parmenter School because you wanted to put the fifth grade for the entire town in the Parmenter School. But why wouldn't you just make that another elementary school and then redistribute the sixth grade across all of the existing elementary schools? And if you needed to, you know, uh, for a period of time, get the modular, um, you know, classrooms as needed. Couldn't you do that? You know, couldn't that be a scenario? I mean, it's, to certainly, be it's certainly something we can look into. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I, I just don't understand. It seems to me that Parmenter was preemptively taken off the table 
and, and I'm not we sure We can that. put anything we want back on the table. Okay, I hope you will. Um, just one final comment on the, um, this plot in the um, book about permitted housing units, Town of Arlington. I would just point out that between 2011 and 2014, you can explain almost that entire increase by th over 300 units of um, apartment developments at the Sims and the Brigham site. And that's not you know, a typical um, development scenario in Arlington, the possible Mugar development as a 40B notwithstanding. I'm not sure how that affected the analysis or, at all, but it, I think it is something you need to consider. Thank you. Dr. McKibben, do you have an answer to that question? Uh, the, uh, the question was pertaining to the large un uh, developments in the, in the past couple of years. Yeah, that's, that's why, if you notice in the chart, their building permits for above 100 will have dropped it down to 80 for the rest of it. Those are two abnormalities. You, if you, you don't have any large apartment complexes coming on, so what the residual is is mostly uh, infill, tear down, rebuild. So that's why I dropped the number down so much from your, your current 140. Good. Thank you. Uh, the podium to my right. Rebecca Peterson, Precinct 16. Um, I just really wanted to make a comment and say um, thank you for this process, but also I'm a former Dallin parent and now an Audison parent. And I think since my first year at Dallin, uh, as a parent there, um, in 2007, maybe around that time or the very next year, there were space issues, there were planning problems, there were, oh, we're bursting out of the seams. And I know over time at the Dallin, just off the top of my head, um, we lost a dedicated science room, a computer lab, dedicated after school space. Uh, there might be more, I don't know. I know other schools are, have faced same challenges and worse across town, other elementary schools. Uh, while I hope that the arts programs can be incorporated into a solution, the solutions that you're looking at, um, I do want to thank you that the Gibbs is still owned by the town because I feel like without that as an option, we would be severely, severely out of choices here. And I, I think it's something we have to look at. I don't want to say kick anyone out, but I think that the problem is so huge across the town space-wise in the elementary schools. And, and at the, now I'm an autism parent of two ch children, and it, it's terrible there. And so I think we just, we have to look at everything. Thank you. Thank you. Podium to my left. Um, my name is Jessica Conaway. I'm a second grade, uh, I have a second grader at Thompson School. I wanted to recognize Principal Donato, who's here with us today. Um, she's a great principal and it's a great community. So, um, Would you stand for us? And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's great of her to be here with us when she's got to greet the students um, early in the morning. Um, my primary concern, of course, is class sizes and the student experience with the second grader. Mm -hmm. um, I want to reference the comment that an earlier um, some person made around educational policy. I've heard a lot of uh, discussion around numbers, demographics, um, capital considerations, but I haven't heard a whole lot about the student experience. And I think I'd like to request at this moment that uh, Superintendent Bodie and the school committee put together some guiding principles for this process and how the students will be impacted, both in their access to specials as well as in class sizes. The other thing that's really... Um, <laughs> thank you. That is my... <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> that is my absolute number one concern mm -hmm. as a parent. Um, also, I think um, all I can think about in this conversation is operating. Um, with the addition of all these classrooms, of course, you're going to need additional high-quality teachers. Mm -hmm. And I would like to have paired, you know, maybe on a parallel track with the capital considerations, how is the district going to ensure that there are high-quality teachers in every classroom for everyone that's added? Um, and I'm sure that there is a plan for that. Um, but as a parent, you know, those are the things I think about. Is my child's experience going to be maintained in a modular classroom? Are they going to have access to gym, to science, to art? And who's going to teach my kid? So thank you for um, 
for taking my questions. I think one comments. of the things that we found is that, that uh, modular classrooms tend to be quite nice. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> it just has when, such a when bad we, When we talked about them at the Odyssey, the, the, the teachers were lining up to get into those because they're air conditioned, they're nice, they're big, they're spacious, they're well designed, even though they're modular. As for teaching staff, th this district has always taken a very serious look at hiring the very best teachers we can. And the reason why you have great teachers in this district, and I think that we've got really wonderful teachers in this district, is this we have principals who hire well. Uh, we have a central office that supports good teaching. We have a good professional development program. We are, within the course of the way we do business, committed to recruiting, retaining, and supporting great teaching in the district uh, at 5,000 students or 6,000. Yeah, that's really wonderful to hear. And I would just ask that throughout this process that that remain on the commitment, just as strong, and I know it will. But if you could also communicate out to the parent community, mm -hmm. you know, how those commitments are being maintained mm -hmm. while you're dealing with this bigger issue, that's, that would be helpful to all of us. And it would mm -hmm. give us comfort that the student experience isn't being degraded while you're dealing with all these other oh, things. I, I think that uh, everyone in this committee is very dedicated to, to the student experience and maintaining the, the high standards. That's why we're going through this, to make sure we have the space required to deliver that product, uh, that, that our teachers have the best classrooms we can No, I hear you, them. and I do appreciate that. I just, I'm asking for communication and I'm just saying what you're asking. Okay. Well, and, and, and along if I, the process, not just tonight, but throughout the process. Absolutely, and I'll say it as often as you like. If, if I stop saying it at some point, Call me up, tell me to say it again. <laughs> I'll take you on that. Thank you. Um, right podium. Hi, I'm Jennifer Le Egare, Thompson mom, District 5, I think that is. Um, I'm here tonight. Yes, I'm a Thompson mom, but I actually got here and delved into those numbers in that report to make my own pictures to understand what was going on, thanks to the email I got from Linda of the ACA, because I care so much about that amazing organic cluster of both big and, and tiny cultural resources. And it worries me that if they were displaced, I just don't see how it could be recreated elsewhere. But um, so I just want to express my agreement with every point that's been made in support of the ACA staying at the Gibbs um, and other spaces being looked at. But as a Thompson parent who has now looked into these numbers and seen that we're already at capacity and we're foreseen to have to support about 17% more kids five years from now. And already we have kindergartners eating at 10 something in the morning for lunch because there isn't room in the cafeteria. We have our fourth and fifth graders doubled up for gym and that's this year, not two, three, four years from now. And I just um, wanted to make that point, but about the core spaces, because this is about the cafeteria, the gym, these schemes that we have, we might be able to add classrooms, but where is the help in terms of those core spaces? If I could please ask you that question. Um, um, I I'm, agree with you, and I think that you know we touched base on that on a certain you know certainly in Audison and at the um, Gibbs um, for having too many. Students, right? You can accommodate them in a general classroom, but what about the specialists? What about the shared use spaces, and and so on? It is a concern. Um, you know, in 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 any of these scenarios, before anything would be embarked upon, a, a study needs to be done and looked at. And so, if as you're speaking to specifically Thompson, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, in particular, uh, that the findings are that there's not enough room in the cafeteria or the gymnasium, well, then that's a bigger concern. So that has not you know, been brought to my attention until just this minute. So again, this is why it's all part of a, a process and a lot, a lot needs to still occur. So. Okay, we have four people online, so I'm just gonna uh, ask the last two people online to come over to this podium and at this point we'll, uh, Unless they're sitting down, they're sitting down. Oh, they're, they're walking around. You can walk in front here. Yeah, uh, and we're just gonna go one, two, three, four, and then we'll uh, end the public discussion uh, so we can do some concluding business of the committee and, and get home at a reasonable hour to feed the cat, you know. Maybe, maybe too late for a reasonable hour. I'm Joe Barr, 24 Park Street. 
third grader at the Thompson School. I guess just two things. One, I, I guess following up on some of the earlier comments, I'd just like to officially ask uh, that this, the school committee make the idea of uh, looking at the, um, now I forgot the name of the school, the, the, where, the Gibbs School uh, as, a, as a second um, junior high uh, for Hardy and Thompson. If I'm reading the numbers right, there's about 170, 180 students per grade. If you put three of three grades into that, that's about five to six hundred. So it seems like it fits its its capacity, whether you however you divide it up, and that seems like a reasonable approach and also would solve other problems in terms of transportation and other things that we all want to achieve, I think, out of the school. So just sort of officially make that request if the Gibbs school is on the table, which obviously has impacts, but since it is, I think that should be a scenario five or whatever, um, or six or seven, however many you get up to. Uh, and I guess the other point I'll just make is the, the master plan was mentioned, and I was on the master plan advisory committee mm -hmm. for the town, and although um, I might quibble with whether the zoning will actually include housing or not, I think the larger point there is that it's important as you move forward with this process to think about the larger goals that were expressed in that plan in terms of open space, affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. The school plays, the school system plays a very important role in that, so I would encourage you to make sure that as you move from just this early analysis into the real feasibility and, and planning phases, you include the, the goals as well as the conclusions of the master plan in your thinking. Thanks. Thank you. And to my right. Mark Rosenthal, 62 Walnut Street. Um, before uh, I came to the meeting, I obviously didn't know what you had in mind, so I had some thoughts about what you, know, what you might be thinking, and I ran some numbers of my own. I, had, uh, I downloaded Dr. McGibbon's report uh, from the web, and I took the numbers that I have uh, for the school capacities, subtracted them year by year, and then sorted the results school by school for each year. The end result is that, um, let's see, this year the school that's most over capacity is bracket. Next year the school that's most over capacity is bracket. Uh, and on and on, year after year, um, up until 2021, after which uh, Hardy beats it by about five students. Um, that being the case, um, I found myself wondering, not, not knowing that you were thinking that Gibbs might be used for an entire grade, I found myself wondering um, why you would be adding capacity, you know, capacity on the other side of town from the area where the demand is the highest. And when you have a building owned by, you know, owned by the town um, that could be used to, uh, you know, to alleviate some of the overcrowding. Um, so I would like to, um, you know, to, to reinforce the suggestion that you consider Parmenter possibly as another K through five to, uh, you know, to do, to handle some of the overcrowding at Brackett and Hardy, um, and that then might uh, make it possible to use only part of Gibbs for whatever, you know, f f for the rest of the overcrowding, leaving some of Gibbs available for the Arlington Center for the Arts. Thank you. Thank you. And to my left. Um, good evening, hi, my name is Adam Del Molino. I live at 170 Newport Street, Precinct 10, um, and I'm uh, on the Board of Library Trustees as well. Um, I'd just like to point out and say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to sit down and listen to everyone in the audience here this evening. I think it's, it's been a great conversation and very important. Um, I don't envy you. <laughs> I really don't. We're, Arlington is really a victim of its own success. And I, I think that's why having a conversation and a dialogue like this is so important. Um, my, I'm a father of a kindergartner at Brackett, but um, I'm also the father of a one-year-old with Down syndrome. And when I look at this plan, and I look at the six different scenarios that you guys are being presented this evening, five out of those six scenarios would move those students, um, and they're students, it's not moving the program, it's moving the students from the bracket to the Pierce School. When my wife and I moved here in 2008, we moved to Newport Street because we're two blocks away from the bracket. It makes no 
sense to me why you would have a kid that's going to be going to school and visiting that school every day and following her little sister up the hill to the school every day for the next five years. And then she's going to end up having to go to school all the way across town. It, it, does, it just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I just, if that's the case, um, if you're going to move the program to the peer school, then I hope that the bracket looks at doing full inclusion for children with Down syndrome at the bracket school in their classrooms. I guess my, my message is this. Don't underestimate the richness that those children who have disabilities can bring to their schools. Um, embrace them. Embrace the full inclusion for those children at that school if, if that's what your intention is. Um, and just um, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time to sit down and see me. really appreciate it. Thank you. I think we have one more as well. Uh, yeah. Well, I asked you to cut it off at that, but if it's a very quick question, uh, I'll put you on the 30 second clock. Uh, your name in uh, street, please? I'm just signing in. Uh, my name is John Eslaney. I'm 51 Tuff Street, which means. You're across I, from the Gibbs. Across from the Gibbs. I love the Gibbs. It's also a reason why I moved to Arlington, had a child, and I believe that I was the only person that raised my hand when the question, second question was asked, are you going to have more kids? <laughs> so, Satisfy so, customer. And I really appreciate the fact that we've had all the demographic information and all the study. This is clearly you know, the start of a really long, open process in mm -hmm. the town. Um, and as a director of student affairs uh, of a well-known school around town, uh, you know, I'm glad that, that we're going from this point forward to start really thinking about the student experience. Mm -hmm. Because if, this pro if these projects were presented at my school, they would be shot down pretty hard. Mm -hmm. um, I would also want uh, the school board to make a commitment that if through the process we end up that we do have to do modulars, uh, that we have some sort of commitment from the, from the town or from the school board that we will have formaldehyde free uh, to the highest environmental standards so that we're not putting our children into chemical baths mm -hmm. for a few years before they get into the next school. Um, I think that's a very important component of modular building. Uh, I think we've all seen through the you know, famous FEMA trailers mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. So something to think about as we move forward if we do end up having to do the bean counter option, which I think a lot of people don't want to do, but we may have to do. Um, and in terms of the Gibbs, I, I, I have a lot of concern about a single, single uh, grade uh, solution, either at the Gibbs or anywhere else. I, I, I think that that is something that, that is drifting so far away from the purpose of education uh, and also the, the issue of we can fit 25 here, 25 there, times 24, and do the math. Yeah. Whoa, we should not be looking at class sizes of 25 if we're going to be building, all right? Mm -hmm. Let's start looking at class sizes that are a little mm -hmm. bit smaller. This is, this is and I, I forgot the gentleman's name. He's always got great comments, Ted or Tom. Mr. Peluso. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. you know, when it, you it, run for town meeting, you can come and hear him. Regularly on the floor. Uh, I, I'd like to invite you to a cup of coffee, Mr. Peluso, because many meetings I always find your comments very, very uh, interesting, at least. Um, I, I did write down, the first thing I, I wrote when I saw the great demographic information was, this is great. This is fantastic. If the problem that Arlington has is that we get to build new schools for a new population, then let's do it right. Let's, let's make sure that we figure out how we're going to do it. And, and the last thing that, that I'd like to say is that, uh, and I, it does reflect a little bit about the fact that, you know, a student without Down syndrome gains immensely from being with children with Down syndrome, et cetera, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's also, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say is it also has to do with intergenerational experiences. I do not want to live in an Arlington that has a senior center on one end of town and an art center on the other end of town and preschool on the other end of town. If we can come up with some solutions here that maybe have, you know, 
seniors interacting with, with middle schoolers, I think that that's a great option. I think if we could take a look and maybe if we're gonna have a, a school like the Gibbs transformed into more traditional education, well, what if it were like an arts middle school? You know, and it only served 350 students, but they were all the artistic students, and they had a children's, uh, a children's theater in-house, and they had an art and a center for arts in-house, and you kind of just kick out the private school and put in the public school kids <laughs> and keep all the art programming, you'd probably find a decent solution. So, something to think about, you know? So, but I thank you. Ms. Cowles, can you just comment on the quality of uh, portables, because that issue was mentioned. I know you've spoken to us in the past question. about that. Very, very, very quick response, because I, I want... Well, my question was, if there's a place where we can go, because I feel like modulars are going to come up, and no, we have no idea what they look oh, like. Oh, wait, you're, you're, you're asking question. the question. Oh, actually, her question was also... Well, come Rochelle, and ask question, I'm Rochelle that's, Dobbs, that's where District 9. I have uh, what, what's your name? Rochelle Dobbs, okay. District 9. I have twin boys in first grade at Thompson. In a couple years, I have twin girls coming in Thompson. I'm part of the problem. Yay! Um, <laughs> and I just feel sorry, sorry, Arlington. Um, and I just feel whether it's short term or long term, these modulars are going to be part of our school system. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea what they look like. I feel like. I would feel better. Is there a place to go where we can see a rendering of what they would look like, particularly these two stories? Like, I think of construction worker trailers, and that's not where I oh, want no, my no, kid. No. Like, I have no idea what these look like. Yeah, is there the a place the to go? The committee has seen some of this, and it's impressive. Because I've Cowell, never seen anything. Can, can you uh, uh, give a, a brief explanation of how wonderful these things are? Well, yeah, it's like, I don't know what websites to Okay, so, so we're, a lot of people are talking about a lot of different things when it comes to modulars. So there's temporary modulars, which you wouldn't do a lot of if you're just going to have it for a year. And, it's, and I, I agree with what your assessment. Most people, teachers, love to be in them because they're air conditioned. So they're very, very popular until they start to leak, which happens a few years down the road. But if you're using them as a temporary solution, you would not gussy up the outside. It would look like a metal building. I'll call it a box because they usually come 30 by 30 or some dimension like that. They have all the things that you need. They have flooring, they have lighting, they have ceilings, they have mechanical equipment, all, all of that. So, um, and they are not, they do not, wherever that gentleman went, have formaldehyde in them. They are perfectly safe boxes. <laughs> They're just not designed, they don't fit into the context, all of that. So, um, back to the idea of putting additions onto um, the elementary schools. The idea behind that would be um, if you used modular construction, the reason to use that is it's a little bit faster and because they can do a lot of stuff off-site and bring it to the site. That's generally the idea. What I was layering on in my infinite calculations was gussying them up. They would have brick exterior. They would look like brick building from the outside. And again, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, improved mechanical, improved windows, insulation, things like that to make them better for the long haul. So in that case, in what we're talking about here, it would look like a building. It wouldn't look like something else. Mm -hmm. um, well, sure. So. Same kind of idea. The more you do to it, the more you don't know that it was a modular to begin with. Um, I would say I would say the one thing, the one thing that I can think of that you would know is a difference from the two is that there is sort of a fixed height di dimension. So, for instance, at the Thompson School, you have 10-foot ceiling heights in your classroom. You would not have that in the addition. Those additions probably, if we were lucky, would get nine. So, so there would be that subtle difference because you're dealing with a modular dimension when you use modular construction. But please don't consider me an expert on modulars. <laughs> so, so you, you know, they are, they are something that you can go online, you can look at them. Um, you know, we've helped a number of communities to put them in temporarily. Um, so. Where do you see them? Where can you find them? Like a temporary modular? Oh, oh, I would, I would recommend Triumph Modular. That is a p very popular manufacturer. How about in a like, 30 mile radius? Can we go walk in one? You can go to just about any school in the town of Newton. Lexington High is just added on. 
Okay, uh, at this point, I'm going to ask one quick rundown the committee for any last questions or comments. Mr. Hayner? Uh, Mr. Pierce? Let's move the 10 o'clock roll, please. Oh, oh we, oh, we do have to do that, don't we? Um, a motion by Mr. Pierce to move the 10 o'clock rule to? 11. 11. Okay. Motion by Mr. Pierce, second by Mr. Thielman, who's nodding his head. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, six to one. Uh, we are extended to 11 o'clock. Uh, further down the line, Mr. Pierce, any comments or questions? No. I Dr. Thank Allison. all the people who presented tonight and all the uh, people who came out. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Allison Ampey. What Mr. Pierce said. Um, Ms. Starks. Mr. Thielman. Dr. Seuss. I, I can add <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that I wasn't necessarily advocating that the Gibbs be a middle school. Um, I was just suggesting that we consider the possibility. Um, I am at the Gibbs almost every day. My kids are at the Gibbs almost every day. I tremendously value the programs that are in there. I just want to sort of open up the possibility to consider. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, my only last comment would be uh, that the only property we haven't mentioned is the Winchester Country Club. Uh, next item of business is public participation for anything that has nothing to do with this. Did anybody come to talk to us about any other topic? Hearing none. Next item after that will be the superintendent's report, and we'll take about a two-minute recess for the room to clear. Thank you. Thank you. September 1, so yeah. You Okay, let's uh, see if we can't wrap this up. We're going to do a very brief superintendent's report, followed by the uh, consent agenda, then we'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Superintendent Bodie, you have a couple of things to mention. Just two, uh, two things. Um, first of all, I did mention earlier during the, uh, the meeting that we have been invited by MSBA into a senior study. What that means, it is not a commitment to begin the next process. What it means is that they um, want to meet with um, school personnel about, it's a working meeting to... Could the people in the hall please suspend? We're uh, conducting business. So 
So I'll repeat sure. this. <laughs> We've been, we, we were notified um, a week or so ago that MSBA invited Arlington into a senior study for the high school. What that means is it is a working meeting with school personnel um, on the conditions of the high school, the educational impact. It is not a guarantee that we're invited into the first stage of the process, but it, it is a signal that they are taking our statement of interest very seriously. Um, and that, that um, visit will be happening before the end of September. The second thing is we talked about um, the Great River Charter School, which was being proposed for this region of five districts. Um, the, the notice came yesterday that uh, the commissioner is not considering the application for that school. Yay. Okay. A question, uh, Dr. Yeah. Allison Ampey. Oh. Dr. Bodie, can you speak to whether the presence of school committee members at this meeting for the MSPA would be helpful? I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch I, it. Can she tell, is it good for the school committee to be, for, be at the MSPA? Should, we get, should, should the school committee get involved? Um, I don't think so at this stage. I mean, having a couple people come just to show the school committee support would be fine. We're going to start with an initial meeting uh, and then we're going to go on a tour. They already have uh, indicated the types of things that they want to see. Um, they, they want to know, of course, that there's broad support for this, so um, we can talk uh, about that possibility. Any other questions on that topic? Or, or the charter school? Hearing none, uh, I'd entertain uh, here a motion for the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of minutes September 10th, 2015. Approval of warrant number 16039 dated September 10th, 2015. Total warrant amount. $332,011.12. Approval of TRIP Foreign Exchange Program for AHS students in French, Quebec City, Canada. TRIP January 29th through February 1st. Dates may change slightly for foreign language students. Moved by Dr. Seuss, second by Mr. Hainer. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? A unanimous vote. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Hainer? Second. By Starks, Hainer, Starks, uh, all in favor? Aye. Good job tonight. Thank you very much. Good job.